Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Please take your seats, return. For the ones who are in Zoom, we are back. Very sorry to be 50 minutes late, but it was a great lunch with lots of networking. Uh, good that you are here. Uh, for the audience here, we have hundreds of individuals who are Zooming uh, in from 12 to 13 different countries, which is, I think, uh, an amazing uh, achievement. Um, and thanks for, for being here, and hopefully you had a good network uh, session. I'm Andrea Meyer, I'm the co-director of the Center for Health and Longevity, and I will introduce this afternoon uh, session. We have a brilliant lineup of speakers, at least uh, that is uh, my opinion, of international renowned clinician scientists. And we are talking... Um, <laughs> there was somebody talking next to me, uh, talking about longevity uh, uh, medicine and especially how we bring healthy longevity to lots of individuals around the world. So I will talk about the healthy longevity ecosystem because that's what we need, in my opinion. We need to refresh ourselves, have lots of interactions and build that ecosystem to build a new um, healthcare, I would say, system or revolutionize uh, the healthcare system we already uh, have. Uh, medicine is very dichotomous. I'm an internal medicine specialist and geriatrician, and either it's good or it's bad. bad. If I see patients, they ask me, uh, doctor, is it wrong or right? Is something bad happening or not? And I say, I have good news, I have bad news. And that's how healthcare is. But this is not how our body is declining in terms of organ function. He used the organ function and chronological um, age. And what you see is there are lines. So everything is going down. Everything is declining from the age of 20 to 30 onwards. I can tell you nobody is going to escape. Uh, at a certain point of time, um, there are cutoffs where we say, OK, you decline so much, and we call it a disease. And we have reference values for COPD, for heart failure, for dementia, et cetera, et cetera. So you either have the disease or you don't have the disease. So that is modern medicine. And we can be very proud of it because we introduced medicines, inter interventions for the ones who are sick. And now healthcare um, care is really moving into a little bit of prevention to make from a pre-diabetic at older age a hopefully not diabetic in the, in the next coming years, preventing the onset of the disease. To just say to that diabetic, pre-diabetic patient, please move more uh, and do preventative actions to really overcome the incidence of the disease. I don't think that this is enough. I don't think that this is enough because we have so much knowledge that we should optimize the health. And there was the health spin. Normally, if you have a 60 or 70 year old, they are coming to internal medicine specialists or to the GP practice if it's nearly too late, if the disease already nearly occurred. What we don't do is that we are optimizing the function of the best functioning in certain age groups. We don't do that at the age of 60 to 70, and we don't do that at my age group in the 40s. Nobody asked me yet, what could be your performance? We say, this is your performance and you are going well. I don't know what my performance could be. And that's what I would like to introduce into clinical medicine. And therewith, I founded, um, together with a colleague, Eva Bishrop, the society which is really dedicated to bring healthy longevity to society first, before going to society, to medicine, and then into the society. Here you see longevitymedicinesociety.com, it's our website, and it's a healthcare professional society bringing all the healthcare professionals together to shape future medicine. Of course, I depicted just the age of 20 to 30 to start with interventions, but what I think we have to start much, much earlier, uh, and even preconception, if you want. Um, the founding members of the society are the ones who, most of them, also speak at this conference. So it's an honor to have all of them here, and I will introduce them in a second. Yesterday night, we had the first um, Healthy Longevity Medicine Network dinner with 
clinician scientists around Singapore, which was so great, because what we need to do, we have to spread the word and bring junior scientists and clinicians together with seniors and learn from each other and to build that crowd of innovation that we can really move forward. Yesterday, we also had, and that was a little bit tougher than the dinner, <laughs> we had the first consensus meeting to actually define what healthy longevity medicine is. So you are the first, next to the ones who looked at my LinkedIn and my Twitter account yesterday night, um, to see actually the definition. And it is that healthy longevity medicine is optimizing health span, optimizing health span by targeting aging processes across the lifespan. What we want to do, we want to educate, we want to have the first honors, recognize speciality and specialist in healthy longevity. So it should be a new special training system in the end. We want guidelines and standards because we have to make sure that we have quality and we provide quality. And we want to accelerate our field in an evidence-based manner. That means that we need networks. It can be clinical networks, it can be trial networks. That's what we try to achieve. This is a little bit the concept I am working with um, in the Center for Health and Longevity with the clinical team. We are diagnosing individuals at, across the lifespan, but at the moment, especially at the age of 30 to 60, with a multi-omics approach. And next to that, with clinical phenotyping, but also with digital phenotyping. And digital phenotyping is, I think, the area to really invest in. Uh, because I think that normal randomized controlled trial setup will not work, or I think we are missing lots of data. Of course, we have the technology to track our participants in observational or interventional studies across the, um, the randomized controlled trial. Based on that deep phenotyping of individuals, you can call it an NS1. Uh, we have interventions like environmental interventions, which are often forgotten, but also dedicated lifestyle intervention. It's not eating less and moving more, but really specialized lifestyle interventions. And then together or not together with supplements and repurposed drugs, and hopefully we will also achieve that we create the pipeline to, in the end, and humans have new, uh, new drugs. And we are doing that at the Center for Health and Longevity. What, but what I would really like to achieve is accelerate it and to have that trial network where we actually setting it up at this moment in time. I just want to show you a couple of data because lots of people were talking about clocks out of my group. We were making use of the UK Biobank because we, we need a big amount of data and we need to validate clocks internally, externally, etc. So we also need to bring the cohorts together. So what we did in more than 140,000 individuals of the UK Biobank, you see the age ranges here, we wanted to see can we have an, a clinically applicable clock where we use all the data of the UK Biobank uh, in individuals of the age range, middle age to a little bit older uh, individuals. And we wanted to validate um, the clocks not only based on the incidence of disease, because the UCO Biobank is longitudinally, but we also did that uh, for mortality. And what we said, we will make one clock, but we also make uh, organ-specific uh, clocks. And while doing so, the first thing we observed, which is another paper, um, that there is an incidence of new diseases or the incidence of decline of organ uh, function within the UK Biobank participants that now we can actually predict what function within an individual of a certain origin is going to occur and what's occurring next. Here you see the network analysis and I just walk you through very quickly because the paper is now online since, since yesterday. If from individuals, the pulmonary function in the first six year of, years of follow-up is going to decline, it's very likely that then afterwards the cardiac function is going to decline in the next coming six years. So we are talking about 12 years. If the cardiac function is going down, it's very likely that the muscle health is going down in the next six years. Then the hepatic function, then the renal function, etc. And you see that certain lines are not connected with each other, which means that there might be a causal process. So if I translate that to clinical practice and you have a patient where the pulmonary function is going down, it's likely that the cardiac function is going down. So call the cardiologist and say, check this patient. 
On the other hand, we also looked at determinants of the biological clocks, and we looked at the body clock and, and different organ-specific clocks, and we looked at all determinants. And you don't have to read it here, but very important is that environmental factors, for example, if there's green space, is very, very likely to be a determinant of the biological age in certain biological clocks in human beings, which means our cohorts needs to be much more heterogeneous in what we are measuring, including where somebody lives, what kind of noise level, what kind of sleep quality, et cetera, et cetera, somebody has. We also looked at clocks if they could um, predict the occurrence of age-related diseases, and yes, they can. Here you see lots of data uh, in the slides on the horizontal um, uh, line, we have all the clocks we built, so you do the body clock, the overarching clock, a cardiac clock, a pulmonary clock, muscle clock, etc. And on the other um, uh, vertical axis, you see the incidence of diseases over time up to 12 years. Everything is green and not gray. Gray is non-significant. Everything else is significant. What that means, if individuals with a higher biological age clock have a higher risk of developing these diseases. And you also see if there is a higher pulmonary clock age, that's of course very likely that you have in the end COPD or other diseases. So it's associated with the incidence of that disease, otherwise it would not make sense. But you also see that overall the body clock works, works very, very well. And different clocks and different organs predict different diseases, which we, I think, should implement in con the conventional healthcare system already. We also uh, make use of lots of biomarkers, senescence and chronological age biomarkers. This is a systematic review. I think that we can close the book. We now know that senescent cells are much higher in, the, in individuals who are older, and it depends on the organ system you are looking at uh, where senescent cells are. And you also, we also now know that senescent cells likely accumulate, or they are higher in terms of number in the individuals who have age-related diseases. And this is just one example that we have so much overwhelming literature already that we said, okay, now it's the time to really standardize uh, our diagnostics and propose a biomarker core we are working at the moment uh, on. Here you see all the hallmarks of aging, all the bright, um, uh, smart people uh, in not only our Center for Health and Longevity, but in the Young Lulin School of, of Medicine at, at NUS. Uh, and these people are working together to really standardize um, all these clocks in the biomarker works for, for us, but also maybe for clinical practice. So therewith we can identify. We also have to intervene because I think it's unethical to just uh, diagnose without any intervention. And our colleague, Jermaine Go really nicely summarized that with physical activity, um, that we can interfere with the hallmarks of aging. And there are lots of studies already that you can make somebody biologically younger being on a treadmill. So I think we can also close that book and we already have interventions in head. We did lots of multiple uh, systematic reviews which are on the left-hand side to really see with objectively measured physical activity if that is related to meaningful outcome in humans. And yes, it is. You see all the dots where you see um, the magnitude of the effect and you see that the number of steps is highly associated with every outcome you do not want to have. And therewith, we published an overall uh, review, every step counts, and I think we can close the books. Nobody, please don't do a study anymore if, every, if, a, if a step counts, it really counts. And um, here, at least one million people were included in these meta-analysis. I think we have to individualize care. Um, and I think because we don't do that, our lifestyle interventions do not work. My European group in Amsterdam is doing lots of randomized controlled trials to find the right nudges together with psychologists, etc., to really change health behavior, because otherwise we will not make it. So hopefully next time in this room, we will have lots of psychologists and health behavior um, researchers in this room. And we just published, but in a patient cohort, how we could um, build a framework around nutritional care, which is individualized. So, but the same applies just from a conceptual framework to all other lifestyle interventions. Um, Brian already mentioned that we have um, the, the pipeline of randomized controlled trials nearly up and going. We are starting the AKG one very soon. And I want a pipeline of trials where we have at least five in parallel, where we have one um, a control group and really now make the change in the field that we have evidence and we can actually say what effect size we find in humans 
um, if they are taking a supplement and that's what we uh, need. So we can identify and we can intervene to increase the health span of Singaporeans. What we do, we are coupling together preclinical clinical practice and public health. And we do that by lots of partnerships. We do that by opening up the first uh, longevity uh, clinic in the Alexandra Hospital and while working together with the health district to really bring it into public health. We cannot do that without education. That's the reason why we are at the moment uh, preparing an executive a class, a master and a crash course, a summer school. But we also, as I already said, we are um, highly uh, um, uh, dedicated to get diagnostics right and to have highly standardized interventions to bring that into clinical practice. I think most of you know about our webinars uh, and tomorrow we are opening in Alexandra Hospital, our, our core, uh, where we actually do the study. Thank you so much. And no questions for me, because it was just a short talk. <laughs> um, but every question you might have can also be other, uh, otherwise being answered uh, by the members of um, this wonderful council of the Longevity Medicine Society. So... The first speaker of the session today is Professor Thomas Rando. And I actually um, met, and I don't think that Tom knows that, but I met him first on the Lufthansa flight and he didn't recognize me. <laughs> it was, I think, 20 years ago. And I knew that Tom was doing this great stuff of, um, maybe it's not great for the mice, but really introducing parabiosis into the field where we created so much uh, knowledge. And uh, Professor Rando just moved um, uh, to being the director of the Gener uh, Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Research at UCLA. He is a neurologist and, and a great researcher. Please. Thank you, Andrea. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank Andrea and Brian for inviting me and, and commend Andrea and Eva really on this uh, Healthy Longevity Center in society. I think it's going to be really terrific. Um, so t I'm going to speak now back to basic biology, um, kind of work we've done that has led us to, to clinical interventions actually in others, and I think that has the chance of, of leading to other clinical interventions. So it's a more basic talk, but um, I'll talk today about our work in aging, which we really do from a perspective of looking at stem cell biology. Um, let's see. Great. So whether one looks at hallmarks or pillars or whatever, um, there's always um, stem cells and regeneration are, are part of that. And I think that's kind of a natural conceptual connection because when you think of aging and rejuvenation, as we've, we've spoken of today, it's a process of decline and then return. In the same way, stem cells really mediate a process of, of return back from, from, from injury, for example. So in both cases, it's sort of a clock going forward and then a clock going back. And so I think there's a natural conceptual link between aging and stem cell biology. So we study primarily in my lab the, the stem cells of skeletal muscle. And the reason why is because they're, they're very well-defined stem cells and muscle as a tissue has remarkable regenerative capacity. And I'm just illustrating this here. So here's a cross-section of histological stain for skeletal muscle. And here's a couple of days after a total necrotic injury to that muscle. Well, the few stem cells in the tissue, which I'll talk about, then have the ability to arise from their, their kind of dormant state. They begin proliferating, and they make these new little muscle fibers, which over the course of a few weeks, these hypertrophy and kind of restore that normal architecture. And so really this remarkable regenerative potential. And this is an illustration of a cross-section of, of muscle. Again, fluorescence image. Each of these is a single muscle fiber. These are the cells that lead to contraction of, of the tissue. But here you see one little cell right there, stained for this against this protein PAX7. And this is one muscle stem cell in this field. And they exist in this kind of dormant or quiescent state, doing very little until they're called upon to, to regenerate the muscle. But what we know is that as we get older, this regenerative capacity changes dramatically. So in a young individual, you can injure skin or bone or muscle. It will regenerate very, very well without a scar very quickly. But as we get older, those regenerative potentials tend to decline. We see slower regeneration, less effective, and typically scar formation. So I'm just illustrating this here again in muscle. So here's muscle from a young mouse or an old mouse. They look pretty much the same without any injury. After a first injury, you see very good regeneration in the young. A second injury, very good regeneration. You can do this over and over again. But in an old animal, even after a first injury, you start to see these areas 
of scarring, basically, a little bit of fibrosis. But after a second injury, even at this point, there's still a lot of inflammation, and you get basically ineffective regeneration. So there's a real decline in regenerative potential with age. So we were doing a lot of studies to try and understand this from the point of view of the stem cell biology. But we had evidence to believe that it's not just the change in the stem cells themselves, but it's a, it's a change in the environment in which the stem cells work with age that, that has a big impact. And that really in young animals, there's a very pro-regenerative environment, whereas in the older animals, there's sort of an anti-regenerative pro-fibrotic um, response. So we did these experiments that have been mentioned a couple of times today er, in the early 2000s, published initially by Irina Convoy when she's a postdoc in my lab, and Andrew Brack when he was a postdoc in my lab, using this technique called parabiosis. So this is where we connect two animals, two animals together. Um, and so these are the control pairs, like so-called isochronic pairs, a young pair to young or an old pair to old. But the interesting pairs are the so-called heterochronic pairs, where we pair a young mouse to an old mouse. And they develop over time a single shared circulatory system. So the, the tissues of the old mouse are now exposed to the circulating environment of the young animal and vice versa. And we ask then, how, do the, how does the tissues in this animal change in response to a young environment and vice versa, how does the tissues in the young animal change in response to circulating factors from the old animal? Well, what we found was that in the controls, the young regenerates very well, the old regenerates with a scar, just like I mentioned, but in the old partner paired to a young animal, the regeneration really is as effective as young. And so it really looked like, at, that, at this point, a kind of rejuvenation. And this, for me, these experiments really changed my view of aging, because until then, we had thought of most aging interventions as slowing the process. But this really looked like a reversal of a process, a true rejuvenation, making us an old tissue look like a young tissue. And we studied the stem cells, and they indeed go from kind of aging phenotypes from a molecular or a functional perspective to a young phenotype. So we published this initially looking at muscle and liver. A couple of years later with our colleague Tony Weiss Corey, we looked at this in brain. And over the you know, previous 10 years, this has been replicated in lots and lots of different tissues. A real rejuvenation of aged tissues by exposure to young, to young blood. So this has led to kind of an interesting area of, of kind of biology of aging, this idea that there are factors in young serum, young blood that may have this pro-regenerative rejuvenation um, activity. And so we and others have been studying this and there have been now many, many um, either molecules or proteins that are found for sort of high in young blood, go down with age, have pro-regenerative, pro-rejuvenation effects. And conversely, factors in old, factors in old um, blood that, that go up that are kind of uh, more fibrotic, more uh, anti-regenerative. And these have actually led to, to clinical trials and companies um, exploring these, these proteins and these pathways in rejuvenation uh, activities. But, but we've also asked a separate question was, you know, we're obviously not going to do fact things like um, parabiosis or even chronic blood exchanges in humans, but are there physiologic activities that really have similar effects on stem cells that this parabiosis um, effect has? And really, as you've heard many times today, and as we know very well in the field, the two interventions that are lifestyle interventions that really have the most profound effect on aging in experimental animals are, are diet and exercise. So I'll, I'll talk about two projects in the lab, one on diet and one on exercise, that have really led us to think more about these lifestyle interventions that have similar kind of pro-rejuvenative effects. So I'll start with exercise. So this is work that was done, that was spearheaded by uh, MD-PhD student in the lab, Jemmy Brett, and a postdoc, Maria Arjona. And what they found, in essence, is that exercise in an old animal rejuvenates the muscle regenerative potential. Um, so in this, by exercise, I mean, you know, three weeks of, uh, of, of wheel running. So this is just an illustration of that. So on the y-axis is just an index of muscle repair. And what we're looking at is young versus old. And you can see there's a decline in muscle regeneration with age. If we exercise the young animals, we do not see much of a change. But if we exercise the old animals, we see a marked improvement in the regenerative response. So what we did is we looked at the, the muscle stem cells. We did basic RNA-seq at the time. And we found a gene, cyclin D, which was the most upregulated with exercise and also went down with age. So again, this is published, but um, we, we went on to sort of study how this, this protein, cyclin D, works as a function of age and works in response to exercise. And what we found is that in young animals, cyclin D1 is high, and it suppresses this pathway, the TGF-beta-SMAD3 pathway. With age, as cyclin D1 goes down, there's a, 
uh, deregulation and you get upregulation of TGF beta SMAD3. And if we actually use molecular inhibitors of this pathway, we can replicate the effects of, of, of exercise. So clearly, this has led us to, in this case, a protein and then a pathway that can be targeted for aging and induce youthful properties of, of aged muscle stem cells. Okay, so let me just turn to a more recent project in the, in the lab, which is really on diet. And this is basically, obviously we've talked about a lot of this today, is the idea of caloric restriction being an intervention that has profound effects on, on the aging process and really can slow aging and improve function of tissues across the body in experimental animals all the way up to, to primates. So there have been studies that have been looked at caloric restriction in stem cells in different tissues, but they're complicated and they're, and they're sometimes contradictory. And I think the reason for that is there are many different caloric restriction paradigms. And secondly, people look at stem cell function either during the process of caloric restriction or after the process of caloric restriction. I think you get very, very different results. And so we, we basically turn to a different paradigm and that is fasting, so short-term fasting. It's easier to control and we can look at either the, the effects on stem cells during the fast or after the fast. And, and there's a lot of evidence that short-term fasting or intermittent fasting also has beneficial effects like chronic caloric restriction, and it's obviously much more applicable to humans to have used short-term or intermittent fasting than lifelong caloric restriction. So the question is, does fasting enhance the, the function of muscle stem cells? Um, so this is work done by a postdoc in the lab, Dan Benjamin, and a graduate student in the lab, Peter Boat, and this was actually just recently published. But what they found is that for different periods of fasting, that fasting was done and then the animals were refed at the time the muscle was injured. And so we're looking at recovery, not during the fast, but after the fast. And, and what they found was that basically the longer the fast, the, the greater impairment of regeneration there was. So clearly there's an effect of fasting that lasts well beyond the fast that is a negative impact on muscle repair. And we looked at the muscle stem cells and what they're looking at here is how these cells activate out of this quiescent state into the cell cycle to make new muscle. And what they found was that um, there's a marked decline or, or a decrease in the ability of these cells to exit from quiescence and enter the, the proliferative response. And so this is just a little illustration of that. These cells sit in a quiescent state and they actually take a couple of days to grow before they can divide. So there's this long period of anabolic growth that happens in response to, say, an injury that the cells have to go through. And these cells are tiny cells. They're like spore-like cells. They have low mitochondrial content, low RNA content. And so that's the, 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 the nature of the quiescent state. Well, when, when we looked at these uh, animals that were fasted and we looked at their stem cells, the characteristics of those stem cells were actually even more quiescent. That is, they're, they're even smaller, they have even lower mitochondrial content and even lo lower RNA content. So it seems as if what's happening with fasting, it's it driving these cells into an even deeper quiescent state, which we just call deep quiescence, but it has this characteristics, characteristic of taking longer to activate out of quiescence, and therefore that leads to an impairment of muscle regeneration. So obviously fasting has a huge impact on energy balance, so we said, well, let, let's take that out of the equation and we'll We'll feed the animals normally, but we'll give them a ketogenic diet. And we'll basically make them ketotic without, without fasting them. And what we found was that the ketogenic diet basically had exactly the same effects. It put these cells into a deep quiescent state and impaired the muscle regeneration. Well, even a, even a ketogenic diet has effects on hormonal changes. So we said, let's go one step further and feed the animals normally, and we'll just give them ketone bodies. And so there are two primary ketone bodies in the blood, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the predominant one, and acetoacetate. And what we found is that giving animals ketone bodies mimicked the effects of fasting. So it really altered the stem cells in the same way and basically led to a deeper quiescent state and an impairment of regeneration. Okay, so there's a sort of paradox here because we always talk about caloric restriction and fasting as having beneficial effects on tissues. But what I've shown here is that this kind of fasting or ketone body injections impairs muscle stem cell function. So the question is, are there, in addition to these impairments, are there any benefits of fasting on stem cell function? And what we found is indeed, these cells are far more resilient to stress. So if we use oxidative stress or genotoxic stress by irradiating the animals, the cells, that, the, the animals that have been given ketone bodies, the cells from those animals are far more resilient to this stress and can survive much, much better. So there's really this kind of trade-off between this balance to activate and, and resiliency. If we put the cells into a, a deeper quiescent state, 
They're less ready to activate, but they're much more resilient. And a project I won't talk about, we basically put the cells into a higher readiness to activate. Actually, this is the one that Henry mentioned this morning, a higher readiness to activate, but over time they're depleted. So there seems to be this balance, this trade-off between functionality and resilience. Okay, so we wanted to find out how, how does ketone bodies do this? What's the mechanism? So in a separate project in the lab, we were doing shotgun proteomics looking at these cells, just looking at what metabolic enzymes are very high in quiescent cells. And we found one of the most highly upregulated proteins is this protein OXCT1, which is interesting because OXCT1 is the rate-limiting enzyme, the conversion of beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetyl-CoA. So this is the pathway that actually allows you to use ketone bodies as energy sources when you're fasting. So we assumed that if we, if we knocked out this, this gene in muscle stem cells, we would abrogate the ability of fasting or ketone bodies to induce this deep quiescent state. <clears throat> but in fact, we did that, and it had no effect at all. So even an animal that lacks this ability to convert beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetyl-CoA, these ketone bodies or fasting could induce this deep quiescent state. So we asked, well, what's, what non-metabolic activity might these ketone bodies have that might be accounting for this effect? And work from Eric Verdon's lab now almost 10 years ago showed that beta-hydroxybutyrate acts as an endogenous inhibitor of histone deacetylases. And, and so and clearly there are histone deacetylase inhibitors in the clinic, so we just asked, can we mimic the effect of fasting by using HDAC inhibitors? So we use this fairly generic HDAC inhibitor, Gavinistat, and in fact, inhibiting HDAC's phenocop, the effect of fasting. Um, now we, we looked further as what might be downstream of, of HDACs, and we found that the protein P53, um, which is a well-known mediator of transcriptional um, activation, is the target of HDACs that is responsible for this effect of driving cells into a deep quiescent state. So again, we mimicked, uh, we mimicked the um, uh, fasting by treating cells with, with Nutlin-3, which blocks P53 degradation. So we're enhancing P53 activity, and that has the same effect of HDAC inhibitors or fasting in all of these measures of deep quiescence. Um, and if we knocked out this, um, basically the um, P53 in muscle stem cells, this increased survival seen with, with ketone body treatment is abrogated. And if we used an animal that had a, a P53 hyperactive mutant, those cells are spontaneously in a deep quiescent state and exhibit all the effects of fasting. Okay, so, so this is the model that we have where um, in response to fasting, you get increases in the, these ketone bodies, which enter cells, they are used for energy, but the same ketone body now is serving a separate purpose in the cells. It's inhibiting HDACs, uh, leading to hyperacetylation of P53, and this enhanced resilience. Well, so what does this have to do with aging? Well, we had previously shown in a paper that one of the key features of aged stem cells that's intrinsic to those cells is that when they activate out of quiescence, they tend to die by a form of cell death called mitotic catastrophe. And that's a, a form of cell death just where the cells try to divide, but because they haven't, um, they basically have DNA damage, they die during division and have features like multipolar spindles, chromosome bridges, lagging chromosomes. And these aged stem cells exhibit that form of mitotic catastrophe. But if we give ketone bodies, that increase in mitotic catastrophe seen with age is basically abrogated in old, old animals and old muscle stem cells. So in addition to this enhanced resilience, this same pathway through P53 leads to a, a decrease in mitotic catastrophe, rendering aged stem cells more like young stem cells. Okay, so just to end, you know, is this really rejuvenation? We talk about these features as going from kind of age phenotypes to young phenotypes, and it looks like rejuvenation functionally, molecularly, but we really don't have a molecular definition of cellular age. And until we really have, I think, an agreed upon, how do we measure the age of the cell, it's really hard to say, are they truly rejuvenated or are they just adopting more youthful states? Either way, they're functionally better. They lead to, th these kinds of studies lead to targets for intervention to enhance tissue function or tissue repair as we get older. Okay, so let me just stop. So this is my group pre-pandemic. So a bunch of these people are still up at Stanford and a few of them are at UCLA. Um, I've mentioned who did this work. And our collaborators, I should have mentioned Dan Nomura, who was our collaborator at Berkeley, who helped us with the proteomics. And I, of course, want to acknowledge the funding source, sources that have really supported this work um, all along. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Okay.
Okay, perfect. That helps. <laughs> Are there questions from the audience? jet lag brain here, but um, the, you're saying that the HDAC inhibitor function of um, uh, alpha hydroxybutyrate is not necessarily driving the phenotype, but it's actually an activation of P53, is that? So, so sorry the, for the speed. So it's inhibiting HDAC, and HDAC deacetylates P53. So if we block the HDAC, P53 acetylation increases, and that drives P53 transcriptional activity. I got it. Yep. Brian? So you say deep quiescent state, and then you also say impaired regeneration. So I'm, is it delayed regeneration or impaired regeneration? It's, it's, bo it's definitely delayed because it takes longer to activate. But what you see is the longer you delay the activation of muscle stem cells, the more impairment you see in the ultimate regenerative response. So you see it, so for example, even in aged muscle, they, they are more and more deeply quiescent. So that's, if you could accelerate the process of activation, you could Im improve the regeneration. Do you think that's just a timing issue? There's like I, I, I do. I mean, I think so. If you look at regeneration, there are many things happening besides the activation of stem cells. You have an inflammatory response. You have activation of mesenchymal stem cells. And so if you dysregulate the timing, I think you get an impairment of regeneration from any dysregulation of that coordinated timing. Uh, Tom, great talk, like always. So your model needs an injury to work, right? Um, is, is there, ex why is it rate limiting to injury? And how can we have activated stem cells in a more physiological long process? So why is it, why is it? Um, why, why, you're mo why you need an injury to look at those stem cells or I guess the other way is why, why do you need injury model and not find another model to show the chronic decline? Yes, okay, so it's a good question. So, so these stem cells, unlike say gut stem cells or skin stem cells, their normal turnover is very slow. So there's a very infrequent activation and then say replacement of a muscle fiber nucleus. Most of the evidence in the literature is that if you, if you even deplete the muscle, the stem cells, you don't see any chronic effect on the muscle. So they're almost as if these cells are truly in reserve for repair, not for homeostasis. So we're kind of stuck. I mean, that, that's the, what these cells seem to be doing. And we've, we've tried these experiments. We've tried to deplete them and look at long-term effects. And they're just, they're very subtle if they're there at all. I mean, I would love to think that, for example, we've talked a lot about this with people here, that these stem cells could prevent or could m mitigate the effects of sarcopenia, right? That, that over time, if one of the effects of sarcopenia is the fact these stem cells are not replacing muscle, but that seems not to be the case. It really seems as if sarcopenia is a muscle fiber intrinsic process that is little affected by the stem cells in the tissue. So, yeah, so they, you know, basically, at least the biology that we understand is more of a um, reserve cell for injury repair as opposed to a homeostatic function. Yeah, next question. With the, um, with the conversion to, say, a ketogenic diet and then the, uh, uh, the reversion of the stem cells to this deep quiescence, is, does that persist uh, if you remove the ketones, whether it's diet or exogenous? Uh, and if so, is there any indication as to whether or not you could cycle through ketogenic diet or perhaps just continually take a low dose of exogenous ketones? And then just related, uh, is there any indication of what percent of these, or what percentage of these, of the stem cells would go into deep quiescence? Is that dose dependent or duration? So, you know, all good questions. So we, we've looked at the, the decay of the response. So if we give a ketogenic diet or if we give ketones, um, the effect is not permanent. So it wears off over time and sort of relates to some of the er talks earlier. Um, and it, it decays fairly quickly. So, you know, we give ketones for a week, you look a week later, there's very little effect. So it really requires continuous administration. Um, sorry, the second part of your question was? Well, it was related. Uh, if, you, uh, if you take the ketones, it 
say it's exogenous or, or yeah. um, through diet. Uh, the longer you do it, the higher percentage of, of stem cells would enter deep quiescence? We, so we really haven't done a good dose-response relationship to, to even look at that, sort of what percentage of cells are in deep quiescence. Um, so we've given high levels, it's, you know, they're very ketotic, and so it looks like the vast majority of cells under these conditions are in this deep quiescent state. Um, so we just haven't done that dose, dose response. But, but again, no matter what we do, whether it's a ketogenic diet or administering ketones, it seems as if it needs to be continuous to maintain this, this, you know, this benefit of, of high resilience. Christian? Uh, thank you very much. So if you, uh, you stated that a uh, high level of ketones is necessary to drive these kind of changes, and you also mentioned that um, intermittent fasting may also be effective, but it takes a lot of fasting to get you in the ketotic state. So is there a separate mechanism? Well, so it's absolutely true. It takes a lot of fasting to get humans into a ketotic state, but the, the mice go quickly into a ketotic state. So, you know, we push it to two and a half days. That is a very long time for a mouse to be um, fasting. They lose weight. Um, so, so for humans, it would be, a, you'd have to be a lot longer to, to get to the ketotic state. Okay, yeah. good. So may I ask you yeah. one more question? Because of your parabiosis, I think lots of people were thinking, let's give me a blood transfusion. Any evidence? So no evidence. <laughs> um, so for one thing, most, I would say all transfusions, um, at least in the US, you get blood that is de-identified. So you, you can't go in and ask for young blood. So, so you have, you have, if you're getting a transfusion, you, you don't get a choice there. And also they tend to be mixed. Um, but as far as I know, and we've looked a lot, there's no evidence of, uh, of a transfusion having an, any, any kind of lasting effect. But of course, in the parabiosis paradigm or in the serum transfer experiments, we're doing a lot of transfusions or they're constantly parabiosed. So a single transfusion is unlikely anyway. But even, even given that, there's very little evidence, there's no evidence, I would say, that um, transfusions of blood have a long lasting effect. Now that hasn't stopped people from from doing it. So, okay. so yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Don't play a vampire. Thank okay. you so much, thank you. Tom. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker is Professor James Kirtland, and he is a geriatrician, so from neurology to, to geriatrics. He is the director um, of the Center on Aging at the Mayo Clinic, and I know James really from the senescence field. So if you want to talk to the person doing trials, randomized controlled trials, to get rid of senescence cells, this is the man. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, and to the organizers, a delight to be here. And let me just see if I can make this go forward. So we've all heard about um, these pillars are of aging. I think very, very simply. I, don't, I can't think in terms of eight or 13 or whatever pillars. I like to think in terms of four things because I'm a stupid individual. And um, one of the things about these uh, processes is that they tend to be highly interlinked, as has been shown. And increasingly, it looks like if you apply an intervention, you affect the other so-called pillars of aging sometimes in concert, sometimes not. So an intervention point between factors that impact the rate at which aging processes occur and downstream effects of aging is by targeting these uh, particular processes. Um, I'm gonna focus on cellular senescence just as an example, but I could equally well talk about inflammation and fibrosis, uh, macromolecular things as has been talked about, and uh, progenitor cell function. So cellular senescence, I think, as most people are aware, um, can occur at any point during life um, or even uh, before conception. Uh, looks like Down syndrome is a senescence-driven disorder. Uh, aging processes occur throughout life and can be accelerated at sites of multiple diseases. Um, senescence can occur in both dividing and non-dividing cells. Um, around 30 to 70% of senescent cells can develop a pro-inflammatory, pro-apoptotic secretory state 
Most senescent cells develop a secretory state, but in some cases it is not pro-inflammatory and pro-apoptotic. Uh, the secretory phenotype involves production of not just proteins and peptides, uh, but also a range of bioactive lipids, um, uh, including prostanoids, ceramides, and so forth, and a whole lot of non-coding nucleotides, uh, especially microRNAs, circular DNA, and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and these seem to be bigger drivers of a lot of things even than some of the proteins and peptides that get produced. It's very hard to define what a senescent cell is. This is a cell fate, like replication, differentiation, or apoptosis. So the nature of a senescent cell depends on the cell type that became senescent, how long it's been senescent, the inducer of senescence, and the microenvironment. Uh, and I wouldn't say that there's any one parameter that people would accept as a valid marker of senescent cells. Typically, you have to look at four, five, or six of them and make an educated guess in the same way as how would you call a cell differentiated or not. Uh, a differentiated fat cell is going to be very different or very distinct from a differentiated um, uh, 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 kidney cell, for example, of some sort. So one thing about... Um, uh, senescence, as I mentioned, it can occur at any point during life. There are beneficial effects of senescence. It's a way of slowing down or preventing cancer development. Senescent cells accumulate in the placenta during the last five days of pregnancy. They produce the factors that drive the baby through the birth canal. Um, they're important in uh, tissue regeneration, and there are multiple other places where senescent cells are beneficial. They can be important in wound healing if they're of the non-apoptotic, non-inflammatory type. Those senescent cells are the ones that produce GRO1 alpha and PDGFAA, for example. So it's a subset of senescent cells that are important in wound repair, whereas other senescent cells, the, the, the pro-apoptotic ones, can actually impede wound repair. So there are all kinds of different senescent cells and different things they can do. If you transplant small numbers of um, senescent cells, say, that are autologous, made from ear fibroblasts and radiating them, into the peritoneum of mice and, and label them so you can track them, you can find that there's a threshold effect. So if one in 10,000 senescent uh, cells in the transplanted mouse is a senescent cell, that's sufficient to induce after a few months an early frailty state and early death, and the animals die of all causes that mice die of um, at old age. N not, not just one cause, but all of them. And this could be true with all of the other fundamental aging processes. So we're trying to fulfill cost postulates, add the things in and remove them, uh, and, and see if there's uh, any kind of a causal link. I mentioned there's a threshold effect. So in a middle-aged animal, you have to transplant a million senescent cells intraperitoneally. In an older animal, you can transplant 500,000 senescent cells and get the same effect. Or a middle-aged animal that you high-fat feed, you can transplant 500,000 senescent cells and get the effect. So there's a combination of exogenous plus endogenous senescent cells that determines the threshold. Part of the reason for the threshold effect is that their senescence spreads, not just locally, but systemically, uh, so in an endocrine manner. So if we transplant senescent cells into the peritoneum, they track into adipose tissue in mice if they're ear fibroblasts, and they stay inside the peritoneum. But we find cells start becoming senescent in the arms and legs. Uh, and they're the, they're the mouse's own cells, the recipient mouse's own cells that become senescent. Um, we've got data that we're publishing with Hopkins showing that the abundance of senescent cells in knee joints removed uh, during osteoarthritis surgery when spinal anesthesia is given, the, that abundance correlates very closely with senescent cell burden in the CSF. So, and we, we know these people with osteoarthritis are dying five or 10 years earlier of Alzheimer's disease and other groups. So it looks like there's endocrine spread of senescence once you're beyond a threshold. If we transplant organs from older animals to younger animals, um, we find there's spread of senescence from the old organ um, to the uh, younger animal, and they're not traveling through the circulation. These are the younger animals' own cells start becoming senescent. This is largely driven by mitochondrial DNA, as is transplant rejection. So mitochondrial DNA gets to um, lymph draining lymph nodes, activates dendritic cells, and causes early rejection. The surgeons all know that if they transplant organs from older to younger individuals, um, even if the organs look healthy, uh, the outcomes are bad. So in the United States, if people have signed donor cards and they die in a car crash, 
even if their kidneys look good, if they're over age 50, they're not used for transplantation. We're throwing away 35,000 kidneys a year, uh, just based on, on this. So uh, people have mentioned Ned Sharpless a number of times. He came out with an important paper in 2004 in Journal of Clinical Investigation. And he showed that senescent cell burden, there had been a lot of debate about this beforehand, but he, he showed that senescent cell burden seemed to correlate with degree of frailty in mice, and specifically that things like caloric restriction or other interventions that extend health span in mice are linked to a decrease in senescent cell burden. So that led Tamara and myself when we were in Boston to start trying to figure out ways to selectively eliminate senescent cells. And we went down all kinds of blind alleys. We worked with Jack Murphy, who first discovered fusion proteins to try to make get antibodies that would bind to senescent cells and carry a toxic cargo. We tried with Sanford Burnham to set up high throughput screens. Then it finally hit us in May 2013, and it only took us a month to find senescent cells once we figured this out, that um, the 30 to 70 percent of senescent cells that are producing pro-apoptotic factors are killing cells around them, but they themselves are surviving much like B lymphoma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia cells. So we used um, mass spec data and early um, uh, bioinformatics approaches to ask if there are pro-survival pathways that would defend the 30 to 70% of senescent cells that are pro-apoptotic against the things that they're using to kill cells around them. And we identified five pathways that we call SCAPs, or senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. Since then, another five have been discovered. And they resemble, in some ways, what you see in cancer cells. We used um, uh, these bioinformatics approaches to map out a network of pathways that senescent cells use to defend themselves. Uh, different kinds of senescent cells use different uh, pathways within this network. So um, not every senolytic agent will kill every kind of senescent cell. And in some cases, senescent cells depend on redundant pathways. So we used programs from the Broad Institute to try to look for agents that would target key nodes based on RNA interference studies where we'd identified key nodes. We, f we came up with a list of 39 agents. All of them turned out to be senolytic, uh, but they're senolytic against different human cell types. Uh, so using this mechanism-based approach, there have been now 40 or 50 agents found. Them. One of the more recent ones we found with Dr. Song in um, Shanghai, uh, procyanidin C1. Uh, and then people have since developed um, high-throughput screens, um, library screens, and other approaches like vaccines and so forth that might target senescent cells. Um, if we uh, treat animals that have been transplanted with senescent cells, we show that we clear the 30 to 70 percent of senescent cells that have a pro-apoptotic SAS. We don't kill every senescent cell. It's only the ones that are pro-apoptotic and pro-inflammatory that we kill. So the effects of senolytics are very different from when you knock out highly P16 or highly P21 expressing cells in animal models. They're totally different, in fact. We see improvement in wound healing, for example, with senolytics, where with experimental animals where you knock down P16, you see slowing of wound healing. If um, one of the screens we do is to take adipose tissue from younger diabetic obese individuals with incipient renal failure from the operating room, we can put them into uh, organ culture for up to 72 hours. We can add drugs. We can see how long it takes senolytics to kill um, uh, human senescent cells, say, in adipose tissue. It takes about a two-hour exposure. Uh, is sufficient to initiate an irreversible process of apoptosis, which takes 18 hours to complete. Uh, it takes one to six weeks for new senescent cells to form. So we purposely looked early on for drugs that are already in human use or natural products uh, that have short elimination half-lives so that we could administer these drugs in a hit-and-run manner. Um, if we um, administer these kinds of agents to older animals, and incidentally, there's no point in giving senolytics to animals that, or humans that don't have senescent cells. So one of the criteria we use for all our clinical trials is we have to show that there are senescent cells in patients before we administer the drugs. Uh, but there, there can be some pretty dramatic effects. Um, when we uh, give senolytics intermittently, or a short course in this case of senolytics to animals that have been transplanted with senescent cells, we're able to prevent them developing frailty and early death. We just have to give it once to them in their lifetime. The same way as after radiation, we have to just give one dose in the lifetime of the animal because there's no impetus for new senescent cells to form. Um, in um, 
when, uh, with these heart transplant models that we did with Stefan Tullius, who's um, chief of transplant surgery at uh, uh, the Brigham in Boston, uh, we found that if we treat the um, donor, the heart itself, or the recipient, we could, um, uh, with senolytics, we could reduce um, uh, mortality and uh, re rejection rates. So this is a basis for the clinical trials that are going on now to try to rehabilitate uh, kidneys and livers in life port systems before they're transplanted. Um, you know, we're, we're just doing that as an observational study at the moment in organs that are being discarded because they're from older individuals. All these fundamental aging processes are interlinked, as was mentioned before. With respect to progenitor cell function, they can, senescent cells can have biphasic effects. It depends on the kind of progenitor cell. Some people would call stem cells. I prefer to call them progenitor cells. But senescent cells produce factors that, for example, increase osteoclast uh, differentiation and formation, osteoclast progenitor, whereas they produce factors that decrease osteoblast formation, the, the opposite effect. And osteoclasts are cells that break down bone. Osteoblasts are cells that make bone. If you give senolytics, you reverse these effects. So it's not always a, a general increase or decrease in progenitor function. We see it depends on the kind of progenitor and the kind of senescent cell. So I won't go through it all, but there are at least 70 conditions in preclinical models, uh, mainly my some rats, um, some studies in uh, primates, where there appears to be, and, and human tissues, where there appears to be um, a potential response to senolytic agents. And this could equally apply to rapalogs or metformin and so forth. Incidentally, rapalogs and metformin act in part by inhibiting the secretory state of pro-inflammatory senescent cells. Senescent cells also seem to be um, a major uh, source of increased mTOR in tissue with aging. Senescent cells produce factors that upregulate CD38, which breaks down NAD. Any low NAD in turn results in ROS being generated, which causes cellular senescence. So these processes appear to be highly interlinked. So one of the things we founded um, going on three and a half years ago was the Translational Geroscience Network. It includes the founding universities that are listed on the top. And we brought in five other uh, groups where we're trying to do clinical trials, not just of senolytics, but also of uh, rapalogs, metformin, um, sirtuin agonists, uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, and a range of other kinds of compounds, as well as observational studies. We're trying to do these uh, studies in parallel rather than in series. Uh, we're bringing in a Canadian network, so the Canadian government's going to put $130 million into this. Um, we don't know exactly who will be in the network. The Japanese are setting up a network, and we've got five or six clinical trials in Europe now and several beginning in Britain. And we're trying to use similar protocols across all these trials for a range of conditions, but we're trying to measure sim similar things across all the trials. So one of the early trials of Senlytics, it's an open label uh, trial with all the problems that those have. It's a phase one, um, you know, learning effects and all this other kinds of stuff, which uh, gives you real cause for uh, caution. But this was in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a senescence-driven uh, disorder. Uh, we gave nine doses of senolytics over a three-week period, and then we um, looked at functional measures because the main thing most clinicians would realize that people with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis get and die of isn't shortness of breath, it's frailty. That, that seems to be the overwhelming uh, problem that these people have. So we measured frailty measures and six-minute uh, walk, um, four-meter gait speed, uh, chair stands, and short physical performance battery. And those all improved, but it, that's phase one. So phase two trials are beginning in that condition. We also did initial target engagement trials in humans where we um, took younger obese diabetic individuals with incipient renal dysfunction, uh, did fat biopsies at day 0 and 14, and took blood at day 0 and 14, gave three days of senolytics, day 0, 1, and 2. The senolytics we've chosen on purpose have very short elimination half-lives. Fizetin has an elimination half-life in mice of 45 minutes. Uh, Fizetin has about a, th a three hour elimination half life in humans, Dasatin of three hours, and Kersetin 11 hours. So these drugs are gone very quickly. In fact, the FDA did not require us to do pharmacokinetic studies uh, because we're using hit and run approaches. We're trying for a high peak level. We're going after a cell type. The division of the FDA that we're working with is the same division that develops antibiotics. So they're not interested in a one drug, one target, one disease approach. Uh, they're interested in the way that you develop any, like say with the urinary tract infection, you might use five drugs. You don't care too much what the molecular target is. You care you're killing a particular kind of bacterium. 
uh, and you can give intermittent dosing, and you may have to give the dosing only once in an individual's life, and you don't care about blood levels, you care if you're killing the bacteria. So that's actually been the F FDA's view of these things. We also found, um, we found decrease in senescent cell burden as indicated roughly by decreases in highly P16 expressing cells and SA beta gal expressing cells, but SA beta gal is only two thirds sensitive and specific, so we have to be very careful of these things. Uh, we did find decreased activated macrophages. I won't go into the mechanisms of this, but senescent cells attract, activate, and anchor immune cells. This isn't by killing activated macrophages, this is by preventing uh, import of monocytes and conversion to uh, and, and activation. We found decreased fibrosis as measured by crown like structures. And then we worked with David Allison to come up with um, a composite score of um, blood markers that reflect the SASP. And we found in this very small study that those were reduced 11 days after the last dose of uh, senolytics because these cells take a long time to recur. Since then, we've developed um, better markers of uh, senolytics, and uh, one of them was um, recently published. And um, you know, again, we're finding that these agents um, impact those. We've looked at other things in some of these subjects. We took 20 subjects with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, gave them senolytics, looked at alpha clotho in the urine, because alpha clotho is very difficult to measure in blood. And we found in every single patient, alpha clotho, which is a protective factor, went up. Um, so we're looking for things that um, are beneficial that go up and things that are bad that go down with senolytics so that we can do ratios. We don't want to use ratios to say creatinine or cystatin. Uh, because those things can introduce a bias. So the trials underway, the, currently there are 30 trials underway um, uh, across the US. Um, about half of them are in senolytics. The other half are in things like uh, metformin and rapalogs, or some of them are comparing metformin, rapalogs, NED precursors to senolytics. And the two sets of senolytics being used are either disatinib or carsa uh, plus carsatin or fazatin because we've got the most safety data with those. And uh, the trials are ranging from everything from um, childhood cancer survivors, where we know that um, frailty, we heard about that before, that people treated before the age of 10 with, for um, leukemias or lymphomas, uh, many of them develop this accelerated aging-like state. They're dying at age 35 of Alzheimer's and uh, diabetes and um, fractures, and they, they look frail. We found that development of that syndrome is directly related to abundance of senescent cells. So we're working with St. Jude's in an NCI-funded trial, comparing different senolytics versus placebo in childhood cancer survivors. We're doing the same thing with City of Hope, looking at adult cancer survivors. One of the earliest trials is in bone marrow transplant survivors. They typically get an accelerated aging state five years after their bone marrow transplant and are dying from it if they don't die from graft-versus-host disease or return to their cancer. Uh, that trial is almost finished. Uh, there are trials in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis about to begin. Um, there are um, three trials for Alzheimer's disease, um, funded by the Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, another trial funded by the NIH for mild cognitive impairment that's underway at Harvard. Um, there are three trials for coronavirus, um, one in nursing homes, one in um, outpatients, and one in hospitalized patients. We're starting a trial for chronic HIV syndrome that's funded by the NIH and also by the HIV survivors group. There are trials funded by the Navy for osteoarthritis um, that are going on at the Stedman Clinic. Um, and there, there, there's a trial for age-related osteoporosis. Trials are under in the planning process for adult Down syndrome, uh, which we know is a senescence-driven disease. We're thinking of trials for preeclampsia, which appears to be related to spread of senescence from the placenta to the mother. Uh, to uh, reduce preeclampsia in second pregnancies. And people with preeclampsia are dying early of Alzheimer's disease and other age-related diseases. Uh, so there's a whole range of other trials starting. There are things that I never expected as a geriatrician where my, my main worry before I decided to go back and do a PhD um, was you know, prescribing better wheelchairs, walkers, and incontinence devices. So I wanted to do something more fundamental, but I never thought I'd be down at Cape Canaveral guiding astronauts in experiments. So, um, uh, and actually this Axiom launch took off in April from the same pad as the uh, Apollo mission to, Mar to, to the moon. Uh, but what we did was we've, we've been looking at um, senescent cell burden in astronauts before and after um, space flight. Uh, and they also took cells up that are pre-senescent because the Defense Department and other groups are very worried about this. We know we've been working with Brookhaven National Labs 
the Colorado Space Center, um, UT San Antonio. And we've been finding that very low levels of space radiation, especially hydrogen, helium, and selenium, um, which is in solar flares, but also can result from cosmic radiation from heavy metals hitting the, the space capsule and breaking up. Uh, it takes 1 40th the dose of radiation of uh, atoms traveling at light speed as opposed to photons or electrons to cause a cell to become senescent. So a, a mission to Mars will not be possible um, unless we can figure out some of these things. And NASA and SpaceX realize that. Uh, the Department of the Navy we're doing a lot, a lot of work on with Stedman looking at problems caused by resistance exercise. These, these people have too much resistance exercise. They're having to muster out of the forces early. They're dying earlier of multiple age-related diseases. So every, everything has to be in moderation. Uh, but the Navy is especially interested in um, can they man ships better by, by treating osteoarthritis, which is a senescence-driven disease, um, in sailors and marines. So I, I never thought we'd be doing this. And then there are agricultural applications that we're looking at. Can we increase wool production in older sheep? Can we increase milk production past lactopause? Can we increase the number of clutches that hens lay? Uh, and um, I think um, Felipe's group, you know, uh, um, Evolution has expressed um, a little bit of, like a lot of interest in that because it might affect Sub-Saharan Africa especially. So in conclusion, um, persistent senescent cells, it's persistent ones, can cause, especially if you can't get rid of them, can induce inflammation about 30 to 70 percent. Fibrosis, they produce um, TGF beta, active NA, and all kinds of things that induce fibrosis. Progenitor cell dysfunction, they can cause spread, they can spread senescence and appear to be upstream of multiple diseases and age related disorders. The target is senescent cells, not a single molecule or a pathway. We're no longer dealing with the one drug, one molecular target, one disease approach. They appear to attenuate tissue inflammation and fibrosis across at least five organs now. We've got data with fibrosis. So one of the trials beginning is in HEFPEF, in addition to renal fibrosis, and then trials already underway in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and, and uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, we're trying to reduce rejection after transplanting organs from old individuals, but that's not quite at the point of clinical trials, other than looking at organs and life support systems. Hit and run approaches appear to work. They sound like uh, a miracle uh, when you look at mice or monkeys, but I've done a lot of clinical trials. There's a 5% chance of a phase 2A trial working. I don't believe, I've come up from a 0.001% chance that these drugs might work in humans to maybe a 20% chance, but I think there's an 80% chance they'll fail. And that's why we're trying to do multiple clinical trials in parallel rather than in series. Uh, most of the trials will fail. I, I think that's the nature of clinical trials. But that's why we're trying to do multiple trials at once to see if there's any benefit we can see. We're also measuring the same 150 parameters as far as blood, urine, saliva, epigenetics, uh, microbiome, hair, and um, nail clippings, and other things like that across all the trials around the world uh, that we're uh, involved in. And we're looking at every fundamental aging process um, across all of these parameters. We're banking PBMCs. And where we can get tissue samples, CSF, and anterior aqueous humor, we're doing that. Trials are beginning for AMD. So I'd caution people not to take these drugs over the counter. I'd caution physicians not to prescribe them. We don't know if they work yet. We don't know if they're safe. And uh, I lie awake at night, every night, worrying about a patient having a side effect. Um, uh, so far, and I'm touching wood, as I always do, and I teach my students to do it. Um, we haven't had any serious adverse events, uh, and the DSMBs haven't stopped any of the trials for what that's worth. But we don't really know if they work yet. These trials are blinded and placebo-controlled, and so who, who knows what they'll show. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kruglin. There's room for just one tiny question, a short question, short answer. Is there any? Otherwise, may I ask you, what about uh, nutritional products where possibly synolytics are in their physitin, for example, strawberries? Um, the I amount of strawberries that you'd have to eat for a synolytic effect would be 15 pounds in five minutes. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much.
Okay, the next speaker for this session, uh, before uh, going for a tea break and seeing posters, is by Professor Evelyn Bishop. She is actually a longevity medicine physician and working at human longevity, but she is also a professor at uh, Yangtong University of the School of uh, Medicine. Uh, I know Evelyn because um, we were Zooming every Sunday to actually to build the Longevity Medicine Society. So I think um, we have a very good relationship. You're a fabulous doctor. So if you want to learn about longevity medicine in practice, please uh, get in touch with her. Evelyn. Thank you so much, Andrea and uh, Brian, for inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure to speak um, in front of such a stellar audience and such a stellar panel for our speakers. And thank you, for, thank you for the great introduction. Indeed, we had uh, nine months of very pleasant work together. Um, and I think our, if I may say, our baby longevity medicine, healthy longevity medicine society has been launched uh, on the 8th of uh, August. So 8-8-2022, eight, eight, a lot of eights, very symbolic. And, um, and yesterday we had the wonderful inauguration meeting in person. Um, it's a great challenge to speak after uh, Professor Kirkland, Professor Rando, Professor Meyer. It's uh, almost doomed um, but uh, to, to not be successful. So the best thing I can do is to shift <laughs> from um, science and um, what we know already from aging processes or what is being studied towards what we are trying to do in the practice. And as you will see, most of the speech will be about translating and bridging. And um, let me start with disclosures. Uh, having lived in Switzerland for over, over, over a decade, I think this is what I've been taught. You always disclose your tax statement and then um, what you are affiliated with. And um, I have no affiliations, but um, the clinic. So I wanted to disclose that I'm primarily a clinician. I am an internal medicine physician and oncologist, but most of my work um, is at the ICU unit um, in Shanghai, not only. So I do deal with a lot of complex issues. And as Andrea mentioned in her talk, what we see in longevity medicine or healthy longevity medicine is that we have a lot of interactions. And if you influence one of the pathways, one of the clocks, one of the whichever intervention you would choose for whichever process or organ or, or molecular pathway, you will somehow uh, influence the other. Um, some of the doctors here might know the book, um, The House of God, which is very, very nicely explaining how you might damage one system by healing another system. And this is, I think, why um, we really need to learn how to work together with other disciplines. And for me, healthy longevity medicine, longevity medicine is the most interdisciplinary and also multidisciplinary um, discipline because we learn not only how to work with other specialists in medicine, but also public health physicians, industry, computational science um, experts, and geroscientists. And talking about um, the other part of my life, longevity medicine, yes, I'm also affiliated with, um, with longevity patients. I'm leading some of longevity patients and seeing their complexity from a little bit of another angle. So um, I am looking at their data and trying to bridge somehow this, as I call it, sick care and health care, stolen terms from other experts. But um, basically what I would like to convey in this talk is there is a connection and um, there is not a typical division and we can bring longevity medicine into the standard uh, healthcare as we know it from now and I think vice versa is also very important. So I actually enjoy doing the squad between university hospital. I'm affiliated with Switzerland where I was trained and born. So it's a very peaceful environment and bridging it with now Shanghai where I'm located and longevity medicine, which is a little bit more complicated and still um, in a phase of um, maneuvering through a lot of highways. Now, when I'm 
thinking about longevity medicine, I'm repeating this slide continuously. I probably I will forever. Um, for me, longevity medicine is, is a run, is a marathon against time. So as a physician, we always have to learn and being updated on our field. But in longevity medicine, it's really uh, a double speed that one has to put as a physician in order to be updated also in all the other scientific um, evidence that is uh, on the way and also the computational science, um, as I would like to mention in a moment. And two years ago, we were <laughs> trying to define the field of longevity medicine. I think, I hope this will not uh, get forgotten as a first tiny attempt, not to claim that we define the field, but we already there uh, with Dr. Kai Foli and Professor Javronk of um, Nature Aging tried to comprehensively put a, a small definition packed into one sentence of a longevity medicine, uh, medicine being a branch of precision medicine or medicine that is targeting health span and lifespan, um, integrating different biomarkers of aging and targeting aging, also with the support and the help of AI. And now we have the new definition, which you just heard from <laughs> Dr. Mai, so I will not repeat it, but I like it very much. And I was very, very grateful and honored to be in the room while this definition was being developed. And now in longevity medicine, as I mentioned, it's, just, uh, it's a constant learning and translation that the physician should be doing. But at the same time, our patients are learning so fast. And I think it's our, um, our task and our responsibility um, accountability as a physician to also educate them in the right sense. So it's very important that we convey the messages from the geurosciences, but at the same time use and encourage the patient to collect their data and build some sort of their tertiary digital layer and combine this human intelligence and artificial intelligence to, to, to work symbiotically together and uh, create a very fruitful for the healthcare Sub, uh, cybernetic collective programming. Now, when we are looking at the timeline of the evolution of medicine, we have some of the highlights, you know, antibiotics, the coincidental um, great discoveries. But when we are looking at the last two decades, I think we have a massive exponential or even faster growth in terms of revolutions or evolutions that happened in medicine. And um, I would like to just point out uh, around the time of 2015-16, where you can see that um, a lot of innovation that we are using now or trying to use in the science of longevity medicine and also in the clinic happened. And why is that? Um, and I believe it's because we've had the tools that helped us to first and above digest the amount of data that we have um, retrospectively or biobanks and the data being extremely multimodal and heterogeneous. So ranging from all the omics through the systems, organs, tissues, epigenetics, psychologic um, components of, of health. To put all those data together from cohorts and retrospective studies or biobanks, which were surely not extremely clean, um, because it, there was no systematic collection, um, into something that will give us trajectory and objective function, such as biological age or actually individualized, at least population-wise individualized um, targeted intervention and therapies is something massive. And this happened mostly because we had the tools of deep neuronal networks, but also other um, AI-based tools of using the data such as federal learning or transfer learning. So all those things were totally foreign to me as a physician. In my, in my, my time, I'm not exactly that young. Um, the, it was not taught in the school. What I'm seeing now with my students in China, and I'm, I'm very impressed with, they are intrinsically self autodidactic in that field. Everybody is learning um, um, machine learning on their own while being residents and working in the lab and just amazing. So what we are seeing is, I think, something very, very great if we direct it in the right uh, path. We still have the reactive medicine or the sick care where we are treating diseases. And I guess this is not going anywhere for, for a while, hopefully at some point of time, but still this is a very important pillar that is also probably teaching us longevity medicine. We have 
prevention, early, secondary, and tertiary prevention, that has been there for a long time. And I think it's important to, to, to mention that longevity medicine is not only prevention medicine. It's a, a valid argument to say prevention has been there for a long time. So longevity medicine is something that is taking a step even more ahead where we are actually preventing the risk of ever developing a disease, or at least that's the overarching goal that we are aiming for. I know that we are not there yet, but hopefully at some point of time. And moreover, hopefully we will not only be able to identify those risks for a specific individual at a specific point of time, but also mitigate and hopefully also eliminate those risks. So again, translating what we know from sick care or working with patients, especially with older patients, we know that there is a huge discrepancy between the healthy aging and the frail, poor aging with low quality of life. And quality of life is something that is very, very important in longevity medicine. Unfortunately, I do not have enough time to, to talk about it, but it's a very big component. But we know that we have a huge discrepancy in how do we actually also then triage those people within this gap? And moreover, how do we actually treat people who are younger? So um, I think this slide and the next one will be the quintessence of, of my talk. So in a patient journey, in a normal, what we have learned so far in a normal life path, we're being born and, oh, it's working. We are being born and we are being uh, guided by a physician, usually a pediatrician, assessed in a range of chronological age, what we have learned, all the scales and the ranges in the hospital. And then we are achieving a point of our life that is called, or that we called the peak performance or the optimized performance. So this is how we are shifting the gears towards optimization of the health span and actually trying then to have the person at their optimized biological age at that specific point of time. Now, in a normal patient journey, after this peak, we are declining at a different pace, with a different outcome in terms of lifespan, but mostly this part here is affiliated with different disciplines being treated by different physicians and accumulation of different type of age-related diseases. And mostly we're still evaluated within a range of chronological age based on the studies, that's the system, and ranges that we know from the hospitals. So how do we do it in longevity medicine, at least at this very preliminary steps that we can do right now? We the, the, the curve is not changing. And again, um, longevity medicine, as we have heard many times, and I agree very much, is not about extending the lifespan. The current healthcare has already done it. That's why we have the silver tsunami. So we are now trying to extend the health span. If the lifespan extension is affiliated with this in a good health and good quality of life, great. But that's not the primary goal. So, oh, sorry. And so in longevity medicine, we are now trying to, with the help of different types of data that I have shown previously, establish with help of clocks, different types of clocks, the biological age of the person at a specific point of time. And then also to understand which parameters play a role and to which uh, type of range should they be restored or changed so that the person will be at, its, uh, at his or her best um, biological age at a specific point of time. And it doesn't mean that we will always try to bring somebody to the age of 30 or 40 biologically, not at all. The bio optimal biological age will be changing across the health span. And that's the second part of the definition, optimizing health span across the lifespan. In terms of practical longevity medicine, we have two legs, as I like to call it, the diagnostics and the therapies. The diagnostic leg is the stronger right now, but the argument, why do we do diagnostics if we don't know how, what to do with it later, is I think in this field maybe too preliminary, because if we don't have enough diagnostic tools right now to identify the right biomarkers, we will never be able to at all validate any interventions that are on the way. So 
in my personal pers um, uh, opinion, it's important to diagnose and to diagnose a lot, meaning to measure a lot and as much as possible, as Professor Kirkland mentioned, also to sample. I'm working a lot with iPSCs and any other types of tissues that we can collect from patients, mostly cancer patients, so healthy and not healthy tissues, compare, etc., in order then to really curate huge data sets that can be validated and hopefully give us some of a perspective on what should be measured later on as a biological biomarker of, of healthy longevity. And some of the attempts are being done already. There are clinics that are comprehensively measuring a lot of what we would call partially longevity, diagnostic biomarkers, so all the type of physiological, omics, uh, genetics, um, imaging, um, physiological and psychological, and then also neurodegenerative markers. For example, in, at HLI, it's about 150 gigabytes per patient per year, every time. And with this, um, there is um, f further scores that are developed, for example, in genetics, what is very helpful, at least to motivate the patient to do something, is the polygenetic uh, or the polymorphic risk score. Um, and also pharmacogenetics, so that uh, at least we don't do some massive mistake in treating a patient with a, with a, with a you know, with a medication that is definitely not working for that patient or harming him, him or her. But I think what I'm mostly excited about is really that we have better and better measurements, panels, um, um, liquid samples and liquid biopsies and measurements and sensors that can collect a lot of data um, with, from the patient at their homes every day, 24 seven, so really extremely granularly. And this will definitely help us later on, as we have heard, to develop newer and better AI-based drugs, also targeting aging and better clocks. That um, would be my point um, also relating to Andrea's talk. We have different pace of aging at different systems and different organs and we are aging at a different pace. So I guess at some point of time, it will be a dream come true to have different clocks that are measuring the pace of aging in different systems and a different granularity. That will help us then to develop a proper longevity protocol for a patient to know when to diagnose and to measure what, and then also what to do with it. So one of the things, just as a practical example, is the use of deep um, aging clocks. There are a variety from methylation, but also to photo uh, aging clocks and psychological aging clocks. Um, all the digital ones that are very, very easy to use and do not require pretty much any sampling that uh, will be outsourced. And as I mentioned before, it's very valuable to measure the chronological age and biological age for patients who are, for example, overmotivated. So this patient uh, was actually trying on himself a lot of uh, longevity interventions. And when we measured his biological age, we actually saw that he's biologically pretty further aged um, than, than his chronological age. Um, so it's not good to self-experiment also on the current, um, you know, interventions, get uh, advice of, of, of a physician. And this is just an example of how a longevity plan at this very moment, that's really, I, I understand it's a very, very small percentage of what we can do and we will do in the future uh, looks like. So it does involve supplements and measurements um, and, and the protocol and granularity and it's very much individualized. So that realistically, what we are trying to achieve is not to rejuvenate and minus 10 biological eight, uh, years, but actually to keep a patient at the best biological age across the chronological um, span. I will skip a few slides as we are um, progressed in time. So just to show you that it does include nutrition changes. It does include daily measurement of body composition that's possible right now, even at home. Of course, continuous glucose monitoring with good outputs. And then of course, tracking of patient's progress so that the patient can also have a feedback, quantifiable feedback of what is going on, including the sleep improvement and apnea phases and targeting also biomarkers of neurodegenerative health and mental health. And we are um, having a good panel, both liquid panels and quantifiable MRI-based panels on measuring the brain age and brain biomarkers. 
Um, I would like to conclude with saying that geroncology is something that brought me into the field of aging. As a physician in oncology, I was interested on how we are actually treating patients that are over 65 and have cancer, where no of the guidelines are covering them, and what is actually their outcome in terms of toxicity and quality of life. And I'm very happy that a lot of those pathways of mechanism for aging and cancers are interrelated, and that first centers uh, of geroncology are being opened across the world, like in Shanghai this month. And another passion is to educate physicians. So um, we have published in Lancet about how to educate physicians in longevity medicine. There are courses that some of you might know that are for free um, at longevity.degree that you can take and you can get CME accredited with AMA, so globally valid CME accreditation. And with this, I would like to conclude and say that it's great to be alive in the momentum of longevity ecosystem open for any questions probably afterwards and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eva. One short question. Bengli. Uh, very interesting, yeah. So, I mean, my question very short, yeah. So, uh, as a firmly trained doctor, I'm trained in China in medicine last century, yeah. But, so, what's the motivation you, you went to Shanghai to practice a longevity medicine? And <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the most uh, important experience you learned from seeing Shanghainese, you know, in your <laughs> clinic? Thank you. I will try to make it related to longevity medicine. <laughs> Geroncology and, and cancer mechanisms and aging mechanisms uh, intersections brought me into longevity field. Uh, European Parliament brought me to China, but um, my patients are across the globe. But what, we, um, but what I think is very important is that we also work globally because the ethnicity and, um, and the dis discrepancies in genetics and physiology in, in across the continents are uh, playing a big role in, in practicing longevity medicine. Any other burning question? No? Otherwise, please have a look at the educational material. It's really wonderful. You get CME points, so please uh, do so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>
you know, what I'm thinking about life. So a hundred year old guy in Singapore walks into um, the Great Eastern Insurance Company, is that what it's called? The biggest insurance company in Singapore, and he wants life insurance. And the clerk looks at him and said, you know, we're not giving life insurance to 100 years old. And, and the guy said, you know, after all, it's Singapore. He said, no, but my mother is, is insured here. He said, how old is your mother? She's 120. And she's good? Yeah, she's good. So the clerk thinks better. They go and talk with the boss. And they come back and say, you know what? It's great marketing for us. We'll, we'll give you life insurance. Why don't you come Tuesday? We'll have all the papers ready. And the guy, the old guy says... I'm sorry, but uh, I'm, I'm busy on Tuesday. And they say, old man, what do you have on Tuesday? He said, it happens that on Tuesday, my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> how, how old is your grandfather? He said, my grandfather is 150. They say he's 150 and he wants to get married. He said, he doesn't want to, but his parents puts a lot of pressure on <laughs> Okay, so the, the title, the title of my talk has changed. Sorry, I, I didn't notice. You gave me some title. I, I don't know, but I, I just changed. It's how to die young at a very old age. I think it's a, better, it's a better title. And I think we all have the introductions. I just want to make the point that life expectancy has been like between 19 and 35 for most of human evolution. 100,000 years. I, I, I don't know, 50,000 years. Um, and it's really only in the hundred, last 150 years that we make an advance. And we got to this, uh, by the way, that's, that's in the United States. It's actually 76 now. You know, it's dropping in the United States and it's 85 in Singapore. But really a great uh, progress. But, you know, the bad news is we got diseases we've never had during human evolution. Okay, diabetes and Alzheimer's and stuff, people didn't get old to get those, those diseases. So what did we do? We did mainly a prevention, okay? We made prevention. We cleaned the, you know, we did agriculture, we cleaned the water, we built sewers, immunization. There are all the, also other things like surgery, okay, and antibiotics, but it's prevention. So I think looking at prevention, that's how we need to create now a new history. And I think that that's what you're, we're doing here. We're creating a, a new history. So we all, all know that aging has a biology, and we know that the biology drives diseases. You know, you're born, somebody mentioned, you can born in, with ApoE4 genotype. You're not demented when you're a year old or 10 years. It takes the aging to bring the Alzheimer up. And we did all those advanced, so we know that, that aging can be targeted and, and modulate and, 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 and be prevented. So if we're successful, what do we want to do? We want to test the gerotherapeutics. Let's say we take an elderly population, and in a five-year study, we give the drug and we show that we decrease mortality, okay? That, uh, that and you know, basically we can show it in a, in a phase three like studies. We have to calculate the effect of the drug and how much. And the question, is there a drug like that? And the answer is yes, there's actually an example of a drug like that. And it's called metformin. And I'm showing you just one set of data I'll tell about others because it was very compelling. It was going to pharmaceuticals, to pharmacies in England. And they took 180,000 people that were matching for lots of things, the same doctors and other things. And they looked uh, first at diabetic patients that had two options. They were treated either with a sulfonylurea drug or with a metformin drug, and never mind what they do. Um, it happens that the people on metformin were more obese, but were less, less in good control, okay? So it was only the choice of the doctor uh, what to do. And lo and behold, you see that mortality was half in the patients who were in, in sulfonylurea. But they did another thing. They matched to both groups. They matched control. And I think the surprising thing is when they looked at non-diabetics, okay, they had significantly less mortality than, than the people on metformin. So again, the people on metformin were diabetic, they were more obese, they had more diseases to start with, and yet they had less mortality than people without diabetes. Okay, metformin also extends 
health span and lifespan in, uh, in animals. So the question is, if you give metformin to everyone, diabetic and not diabetic, you know, in this case, non-diabetic, non will it work? And I think that's what we're trying uh, to do, but we're doing it for a specific uh, reason, and that's convincing uh, the regulatory forces that aging can be uh, targeted. Also, metformin works on all of the hallmarks of aging. All of the hallmarks of aging. Now, you must think that I'm crazy, okay? How can one drug uh, work on the all hallmarks of aging? But Matt will tell you that rapamycin is doing the same. All the true gerotherapeutics are working on, on all of the hallmark of aging, and it's simply because whatever they are doing, they're taking an old cell or an old organ or an old body and making it young again. So, so or making it younger, I should say. And that's why they're fixing a lot of things. And we spend a lot of time arguing, hey, this is the mechanism. No, this is the mechanism. When in fact, for me, a gerotherapeutic should affect several hallmarks of, of aging. Um, also, I did start with longevity. But the interesting thing that metformin in clinical studies and other studies show that it prevents a variety of other diseases, you know, di di diabetes in non-diabetic, cardiovascular disease, cancer, cognitive decline, and mortality, which, I, which I've just shown you. Metformin also happens to be a very safe drug. It, I don't know that there's better data than metformin in the world because it's chronically used and there are billions and billions of years of use and we know how safe it is. And it's very generic and cheap. So if this will be the first drug in the market, nobody will say that longevity is for the rich. Everybody basically will be uh, able to afford it. So the TAME trial, which is, stands for targeting or taming aging with metformin, is about taking 3,000 people between the ages 65 and 79, and in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, uh, the primary uh, outcome are time to major diseases. Those are cardiovascular disease, cancer, cognition, and mortality. Okay, let me pause for a second and explain to you what I'm saying, because this has been revolution for people who are doing clinical studies. We are agnostic to what disease you have, and what diseases you're going to, to get. It's not about disease, it's about aging. If your mother was obese, if your mother was diabet diabetic and you're obese, you'll get diabetes next, okay? But every disease you're going to get between, when you're in the study, between 65 and, and, and 79, you're getting a point. And we're going to take this construct that we call aging, the FDA doesn't have to call it aging. If we take and prevent it, okay, uh, 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 or, or, or delay it significantly, this is, this is what we're going to show. And I think this, is, this was the difficulty in people understanding this cluster, this cluster of diseases, because uh, what's the connection between the cluster of diseases? It's, it's already, I think, clear to everybody who's here in, in the audience. And again, for me, metformin is a tool to go to the FDA, because as I showed you before, those studies have been shown individually, okay? Clinical studies, the only non-clinical studies were in um, cancer, but in cancer there are more than 250 papers that show that people on metformin have less cancers, and basically all kinds of cancers. The NCI was like, uh, you know, every cancer is its own disease. How come, how, how come you think that one drug will prevent it? Well, because for all those diseases, uh, aging is the... the, the major risk factor. So is metformin the only drug? And uh, Yaps and Chang have shown it before, this paper where basically we were looking at a geroscience guided repurposing of FDA drugs. And our entry criteria was any FDA approved drug that have shown to increase lifespan in any study. And we came up with a 12-point um, scale that six of them are coming for the preclinical trial and six of them from human data. So there's a lot of, of things that have not been assessed. But interestingly, SGLT2 inhibitors have passed metformin 
in their potential effect as a gero uh, therapeutics. By the way, you see, you notice that one of the authors is, uh, is Felipe. Uh, so, uh, so, so in other words, there are other drugs that we can repurpose. SGLT2 extend lifespan in the ITP, and, and SGLT2 inhibitors prevent cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and overall mortality in diabetics and non-diabetics uh, patients. And by the way, metformin decreased uh, mortality by 50% in the UK PDS study. Uh, and that's a clinical study. So we have, you know, we have, what I'm saying is we have a lot of evidence. So is metformin enough? Look, metformin uh, increase, will increase health span according to our calculation during this period by, let's say, two years, one to three years, you know, pessimistically, I would say, but that's the effect. And, and the, the point is that our potential lifespan is 115 years statistically, or we, we, we showed from Peter, you know, 120 years almost. And we're dying, you know, at around age of 80. So we have 35 more years to realize, okay? So uh, metformin and those other drugs can he have a relatively mild effect compared to our potential. So let me introduce you one of my studies where, um, I'll give you an example that we can extend health span, that there are people, there are people who have extended not only lifespan, but health span. Those are uh, siblings who were born between 1910 and 1920 in New York, and all of them passed the age of 102. Okay, so first of all, you see the genetic link, but you know, what are the chances they, they'll pass the age of, uh, of, of, uh, of 102? Uh, Helen died at 110, and I met her when she was 100 years old in her New York apartment, and she was smoking. <laughs> and I said, Helen, none of your doctors told you to stop smoking? And she said, you know, all four doctors that told me to stop smoking, they died. <laughs> okay? And the, there are two points here. If you smoke for 95 years, you live a long life. She, she started smoking when she was at the age of the, pi of the picture here. Um, <laughs> But, 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 but really is that it didn't matter to her. I mean, imagine how much longer she would have lived if she didn't, if she didn't smoke. In fact, by the way, she got to be like kind of a hero because everybody talk, uh, wrote papers about this woman who's 100 years old and smoking. And, and she stopped smoking for a while, but then resumed it because she was such a celebrity for smoking. So. <laughs> and we have... Um, 3,000 people, of which 750 are centenarian. We have their offspring and control, and that's a clinical study that we're doing, and, I men and, and I'll, I'll mention why I'm mentioning those clinical studies. But this is the major thing. Did, did they, um, were they getting diseases when we all get diseases and they were just sick, living sick for longer time, which is not the point? Or is their health span and lifespan, did it go together? And this is here disease-free survival. So everybody here in the beginning doesn't have a disease. And as we know, most of the population between age 60 and 80 get a lot of diseases. In our study, you know, just 10% didn't have any disease. But you see that centenarians live 20, 30 years longer. And even at, after the age of 100, 30% of them didn't have a disease. A lot of them will not wake up uh, uh, the next morning. And this is not the interesting thing. The interesting thing that, that they had contraction of morbidity. They, had, they were sick for a very short time at the end of their life. So they lived, 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 and, and they died. So we have example like that, okay? We have example like that. It's within our potential. So, so, so basically, let's do it, and, and let's go to the next generation. And it's interesting that the medical cost during the last two years of life of somebody who dies after the age of 100 versus at 70 is third. This is CDC data. It, this is from 1993, but it's like that since then. Okay, it costs nothing to be a centenarian, to die as a centenarian. And let me tell you, those guys, when they were 70, they didn't go to the doctor. So, uh, so... There, there is a longevity dividend, and of course, this longevity dividend, I told the minister today, we're, we're thinking of medical costs, but those guys, 
okay, are not in the hospital. So what are they doing? They're traveling, they're shopping, they're spending money. Their economical value is much, much greater than only not being in a hospital, okay? So we have, when, when we to talk to government, we have to make sure that they understand that also. So the hypothesis of the centenarians was, A, did they interact well with the environment? And uh, uh, I'll show you more data, but uh, uh, you heard just Helen's story. Do they have the perfect genome? In other words, we know that our genome have risk alleles for Alzheimer, for cardiovascular disease, for everything. Maybe they're, you know, one out of 10,000 10, people, they just don't have that. And I'll tell you right now, not only they have lots of alleles, they have on average five to six changes in their DNA, either mutations or SNPs, that are likely to get them to be sick and they don't. For example, we have two centenarians who are ApoE4 positive. The textbook says you get demented when you're 70 and you're dead by 80. They're not demented and, and they're dead. So the fact that they have genotype that slows their aging, okay, or increase the resiliency is really a, a, a key to why we're start studying them. And the third hypothesis is that they have low longevity genes that can uh, interact. So just quickly about the environment, I already told you uh, about Helen, but less, but almost 50%, uh, you know, almost half of them are overweight or obese. Also when they're 100 years old. Uh, smoking, 60% of men and 30% of women. Alcohol, not much. Physical activity, less than half of them doing even moderate uh, exercise. In other words, vegetarian, 2.6%. In other words, as a, as a population, they, they, they don't need to do anything special, okay? They don't need to do anything special. In fact, their cohort was the enhanced cohort and their other worse or the same as the enhanced cohort. Okay, so in this population, it's not interaction for the environment. For us, yes, okay, but for them, for them not. Uh, I want to pause because there was so much uh, interest in that about the, the biological markers. And one of the things we've done, we uh, looked at 5,000 protein in 1,000 subjects between 65 and 95 years old, and we asked, what's changing between 65 and 95? And you've seen those Volcano scans. We're putting the data in a computer. It shoots up all those hot, hot lava. The higher it goes up, the more the uh, significant. The, it's a P 10 to the minus 80 here. And two points I want to make. One is some of the markers that we are using have come up, have come up here. So, in other words, in a non-biased approach, it's a validation that those markers are probably really relevant. But the second is that things like PTN and GDF15, when you do it in transgenic animal, they live longer. In other words, a lot of what we're seeing here is a protective mechanism. And it's important to know what's protective and more, more, what's causative. We don't want to lower protective mechanisms, okay? And so it's very confusing just to, it's not confusing to say those are the biomarker, but it's very confusing to look at mechanism or de to decide that we want to lower something without understanding, um, uh, understanding what it is. Um, but I want to show you something really interesting because there's a lot of way to dissect the data and this is a pathway analysis, but the ones in red are all breakdown of tissues, breakdown of collagen and extracellular and degranulation of, of uh, things. And I think it's so important because maybe any way we, we, we target aging with any drug, what we have to do is to stop this breakdown and maybe those will be the best biomarker. I actually think that proteomics is now much more relevant than methylation. Methylations are much more stable. Those proteins can be changed rather quickly and metabolomic, we talked, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a jungle with the metabolomic now. Okay, so the genetics is something that provides really insight of mechanisms. For example, sorry, I didn't mean that, PCSK9, which is a, the new treatment for lipid, 
Um, it was in 2003 discovered that gain of function uh, g give you familial hyperlipidemia. In 2006, that loss of function protects from heart disease. And in 2012, there was a, a phase three trial. So the genetic approach is really much more rapid than starting for mice. The same and relevant to longevity is we discovered in 2006 a, a mutation in APOC promoter in centenarians. Uh, in Amish, a different APOC3 mutation was associated with cardioprotection and increased lifespan. And in 2015, the, uh, the drug was out, uh, out in the market. Uh, so pharmaceuticals are looking for genetic data to develop drug, and actually uh, two-thirds of the drugs that were approved by the FDA in the last year, in 2021, are based on genetic data. So, so our genetic thing is to look for a, a longevity of centenarians, and those are some of the genes that we found and were validated. I just want to make uh, maybe one point. Uh, CTP is a gene that does not exist in most animals, not in rodents, okay? So, in other words, it's okay and very useful to, look, to use it lower air organism, but don't forget that humans are much more sophisticated in their proteome. Uh, so, uh, I see you, Andrea. Uh, so centenarians have genes that uh, slows aging, and we have two drugs that were developed based on our findings. And AFAR is now has funding to uh, get 10,000 more centenarians initially in the United States in order to increase our genetic power in everything. I just want to uh, make a point here uh, to, to end with this point. Kissinger is 99 years old, OK? So I read everybody that a centenarian basically uh, writes. And he wrote a, a book that's called Leadership. And one of the six people he chose to, to write about is Lee Kuan Yew. OK? I don't have to introduce Lee Kuan Yew here. But one of the quotes from uh, Lee Kuan Yew is, if you're realistic, you become pedestrian, plebeian, you will fail. Therefore, you must be able to soar above the reality and say, this is also possible. And I think this day was to show you that people thought that we are lazy and stuff, but no, we have everything. We have to soar now, and we have to deal with this, uh, with this uh, aging problem and health, increase health spin now as soon as possible. So thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is there a question for Professor Basilei before going to the panel discussions where we, yeah, there is one. And in the panel discussion, we are discussing exactly that. Are we ready? How can we speed it up? There is a... Hello. I'd uh, just like to point out that I, I read some studies which suggest that uh, metformin can actually lower uh, free testosterone in older males. So nowadays we are trying to get uh, older people to up their testosterone through natural means, not through the TRT means. So how do you reconcile that metformin as an anti-aging tool uh, to meet the demands you know, of keeping testosterone levels reasonably high in the older men? Uh, so, uh, two points. First of all, you're too young to worry about testosterone now. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm an endo endocrinologist, and let me tell you, yeah, testos uh, testosterone is, is lower. Look, there is a trade-off, okay? There is a trade-off between any drug that we talked about, okay? And, and t the testosterone level are lower usually to a non-clinical level. In other words, the people who get really low testosterone and complain about it uh, are minor, but if they want off the drug, you know, Met will give them another drug, okay? Uh, something like that. I wanted just to say one thing. An NIH study was done on elderly people with very low testosterone level and replacing them to normal value. And basically, at the end of the study, there were also trade-offs, and the decision was you don't give them testosterone, 
Okay, so yeah, there there could be some trade-offs, but uh, you know, you trade off health span and uh, longevity, so it's up to you to decide. By the way, you can supplement testosterone when yes. you take metformin. <laughs> Not that I'm suggesting. <laughs> I, I, I would also say one thing. All those, listen, all, all those drugs, all those gerotherapeutics, we don't know if they are safe to, in, in young, uh, young people. Metformin also lowers IGF. IGF is always good uh, uh, in young people against mortality, against, we did a UK, PD, uh, a UK bank uh, study. It's good for everything when you're young, and it's exactly the opposite when you're old, okay? So, uh, so don't assume that we're talking about those things. I see lots of young people. Don't go and start senolytics and metformin and rapamycin, because we don't know the trade-offs. We have a paper cutting for you. N not a tie, but, but it's not here. <laughs> Sorry. We'll take a photograph later. <laughs> we will take a photograph later. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nir. Um, we will go to the next... Uh, uh, sorry, this is very embarrassing because I knew I already had it, so I had I prepared a paper cutting for him. You will really get it. Um, the next session are two panel discussions, and I would like to give the floor to um, Professor David Allen, who will actually very nicely um, lead this discussion of leaders here in Singapore to hopefully just ask one question. Is Singapore ready to implement longevity medicine, and how can we build the ecosystem? The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we've heard many inspirational and aspirational discussions today. It's wonderful. This sounds great. We look like we're ready to take off. Now for the next two sessions, we're going to talk about where the rubber meets the road. Can we do it? Do we have the infrastructure? And how do we go about doing it? So it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the first uh, uh, panelists, a group of panelists. And uh, if you'd be so kind to come to the uh, stage as I uh, mention your name, uh, Professor Hans May, who's head of Department of uh, Human Genetics, Chair of Outpatients Division, Chair of the IT Board in the Amsterdam uh, University Medical Center, uh, Dr. Christopher Lien, who's a board member of the Lien Foundation, um, and uh, please have a seat. Uh, thank you. Uh, senior consultant in the Department of Geriatric Medicine at Changi General Hospital in Singapore. Uh, Dr. Wang Ming Chong, uh, who's Director of Investments at the uh, Wang Yip uh, Chong Family Office and an old friend. Uh, Professor uh, Chong Yap Singh, who we've met earlier, who is our Dean of uh, Yong Lu Lin uh, School of Medicine. And Professor Ko Woon Pui, who uh, is a member of the Healthy Longevity Translational Research Program uh, and uh, Assistant Dean Faculty Development, uh, Director uh, Clinician Scientist Development Unit uh, at Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. Thank you all for, for taking time today to join with us. And uh, our, our charge uh, in this panel, this 40-minute panel, is to uh, how do we build uh, longevity medicine infrastructure in Singapore. So if I may, I'll just uh, start off with some questions uh, to, directed to uh, individuals. Sorry, I've got my cheat sheets here. Um, and uh, Wung Hui, if you'd start us off and tell us uh, how your work may be contributing to building uh, uh, longevity medicine infrastructure in Singapore. Well, I'm biased. I'm a population health scientist, so I'm going to answer from my experience and hopefully substantiate my answer with literature, evidence from the literature. So I think in order for Singapore to play a big part in contributing to longevity, not just for our country, but for the world at large, we can definitely play a big role in coming out with evidence from population-based studies, making use of our, the advantage that we have a multi-ethnic population here. So, you know, if we look back 
Today, we all know that cardiovascular disease needs to be controlled by, or can be prevented by controlled blood pressure, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia. All that we know did not come from studies from the mice alone, but it came from the observation of just 5,000 Americans living in Framingham, the Framingham Heart Study. So cohort studies have track record of informing us about what really works in the human population, starting from observation, then moving on to intervention that needs to be based on evidence from observational studies. And so we know that cohort studies used to be large population. The larger, the better. And we, we, we usually just collect data using questionnaire. But this has changed since 2001 or 2003 when the Human Genome Project was finished in America. And now it is possible to look at 25,000 genes in a large population at the same time. And we extend it to the omics platform, looking at transcriptomics, proteomics. It's truly what the technology limits us. And if we run out of ways to analyze, we can employ machine learning. So now we can move away from looking at just at questionnaire data and hard outcomes. We can actually look at the process of change. We can look at surrogates for disease process. We can look at biomarkers, biological and digital. And we can do that here in Singapore. And, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, then, and of course, cost is always a factor. And therefore, the strategy is always to study large cohorts for hard outcomes, but to use smaller cohorts with deep phenotyping to observe processes that were previously not possible. So I think this is where Singapore can contribute. And may I do a little bit of advertising here, Dean? <laughs> mm -hmm. So here in the School of Medicine, in the translational, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the longevity uh, program for translational research, we have um, built a, a, a study, or we are building a study of just 3,000 individuals, but with such deep phenotyping, you know, trying to understand them from the age of 65 to 80 as they age. Now, you may say that, hey, you have missed the boat, right? Studying them at 65. But our strategy is to have nest 2,500 of them, the Chinese, in a longitudinal study that I lead here, the Singapore Chinese Self Study, that we have been following up since midlife. So we really hope that in the next five to 10 years, instead of just studying outcomes of healthy aging, we can study the process of healthy aging. I think that's going to be a lot of gems, a lot of knowledge discovery that will lead to evidence for intervention. That was an excellent response. I appreciate that. But you mentioned cohort studies are very expensive, yes. and cohort studies take time. Uh, we have the long-term financial commitment. We have the long-term manpower infrastructure commitment for that. Well, it needs to be a it, it needs to be a partnership between university and the government, and actually, I should add now, be among university, government, and also private sector philanthropic um, organizations like the Lian Foundation, you know, believing in researchers like us. I mean, I basically do two things in my life. I raise funds and I publish data. And sometimes fundraising is very much going around and say, do you, do you believe my idea? And, you know, we, we know that the Singapore actually now has put a lot of money into funding researchers for research. Uh, but sometimes the craziest idea it's hard to get people to believe it. And so we're very grateful always for, you know, people who believe in us, you know, especially the philanthropic uh, found, uh, organizations, foundations who believe in us and, you know, give us the benefit of doubt and let us try our good ideas and turn that into reality. Yeah. Yep, Singh, would you be kind enough to follow with that and tell us uh, what, to respond to her uh uh, appeal for funds as well as support and how we're supporting the uh, longevity medicine infrastructure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm even a more busy fundraiser than Wen Pui is, so uh, I, I completely agree. With her. So, but first of all, I want to thank uh, Nia for bring, you know, uh, quoting Lee Kuan Yew uh, just now. So I, I think uh, it's a bit embarrassing because I'm Singaporean and I've never heard that quote before and here's an American telling me about it. So. Uh, he, well, he said, uh, basically, to paraphrase, if, if you are realistic, you will fail. We have to soar above reality and say this is also possible, right? So that's what he said. And, and the truth is that for us to change things in, where aging is concerned, you know, we need doctors um, who are horribly realistic to start to soar above uh, the reality, to say that this is also possible, right? So thankfully, uh, throughout history, 
uh, people have all, there are always a few people who, who have done that. And I think it's time for uh, doctors to do that more often. Not all, not, not all doctors need to, to soar above reality. I think we need quite a lot of them to stay grounded. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's important that some of, some of us uh, try to go above, beyond normality and reality. And we have to start with, uh, especially with the, the doctors who influence funding, you know, who are the research fund, funding agencies. Uh, and also the scientists there. I think funders have to sort of accept that they don't just fund things that they know about. Right? The more important thing is to fund things that they don't know about so they can learn more about it and then to do something about it if there's something there. Um, and you know, the, the, the two areas of science that I'm involved in, one is at the start of life, how you can um, you know, alter conditions before pregnancy, before conception, during pregnancy and early life so that you can have a better uh, life trajectory for, for individuals, um, both in their neurodevelopment, in their health, and their potential. And the other uh, area, uh, which I only picked up probably about seven years ago, is around aging, or rather uh, healthy aging. And both areas are areas that I can, but 99% of doctors don't believe in. So uh, the area that the, is about the start of life, um, it's been around for maybe 30 years, but there's still very few obstetricians or pediatricians who believe that um, the start of life is going to be the key to the rest of the life. They just want a life mother, life baby at the end of the uh, pregnancy, and that's not enough. That's enough when you're in a developing country, but once you're a first world, uh, you, know, you, you really need to look for a lot more than that. And for aging as well, it's not enough to make the environment friendlier for older people or to find uh, jobs for them. Those are important things, those are very important things. But we need to really go to the source of the problem, is what is causing, what is keeping some people healthy as they age and what is not. And then to try and make it uh, uniformly available to everyone, the, what, what is helping people uh, to remain healthy. So this is one area we really need to go. So we need to walk reality, we need to change reality so that people accept this as concepts that are central to how we practice uh, living as well as medicine. So I think uh, from the school's point of view, that we, and we have a wonderful uh, platform, right? We can educate uh, young doctors, young nurses, uh, and hopefully some of these young doctors and nurses go on to be uh, uh, in the leadership that will influence how things are funded, um, and, and that will then change the whole environment for this area of geroscience. So I, I think that's, how I think uh, the school can contribute to the infrastructure for healthy longevity. Thank you. Uh, Chris, they've both spoken about uh, funding agencies, foundations, supporting efforts in, in uh, longevity medicine. And uh, as a geriatrician uh, and as a board member of the N Foundation, what's your perspective? Thanks very much, David. Um, actually, I, a part of me feels terribly out of place um, in a conference on basic sciences. I'm heartened that uh, geriatricians among us, and Andrea, John. And, and certainly when, when John spoke about um, the challenges of uh, prescribing uh, walking frames, uh, walking sticks, and, and disability aids, it brings me back to the struggles I face um, every day at work. Right? So I'm just a geriatrician. I see my patients one at a time. And my um, area of interest is actually in care trans transition gaps. So every day I look at patients who don't get what they want, what they need, and, um, and all the competing uh, um, challenges in delivering any sort of care that makes sense. And this is our health system in, in, in Singapore that has actually very good outcomes. And, and so each day, I, I, my clinic's overrun uh, terribly, and, uh, and that's because I, I spend my time trying to plug gaps that haven't been addressed, and knowing full well that when the patient leaves my room, the gaps will also not be addressed, right? And, um, and, and we also have research funds in the hospital. I, I'm holding on to two or three grants, and, and you know that grants are constricted by, constrained by many different ways we have to do what the grant allows you to do. And that's not what research is really about because in research, lots of things fail. And when things fail, that's where the opportunity comes in. And 
you don't really have uh, the, the opportunity to go back to NRF and say, actually, my grant has really failed, but this is, this is the great result, I want to tell you, you know. <laughs> the failure is so great that, you know, I want to do something about it, right? Um, but I guess stepping out, that's where, uh, um, and again, I feel terribly inadequate with the, with the Lian Foundation hat, you know. The family has uh, been given this opportunity to look at problematic uh, systems, to, to, to have some courage in, in trying to step into a space where where people don't really uh, feel safe to go. And, and you, you know this is not the first time we've gone into, <laughs> into areas where people don't feel that it's the right thing to do. Right? We've done some work on nursing homes that got us into a little bit of uh, awkwardness. And, um, but I think uh, um, some of it comes from the heart. Right? You just believe that this is the right thing to do. But, um, but a lot of it also comes from awareness. And, um, and I have to, to uh, give my admiration to POA from, uh, from our chief executive to really study this, this space, to, to surface things to, to us and as governors and me as a, uh, a doctor on things that I've never thought about. And, um, and to really begin to, to draw attention to this space. You know, in, we are in a country that's very KPI driven. So if you don't give government KPIs, government will be hesitant to fund, right? But there is a different uh, sort of data that we're looking at. And Peter sort of gave, gave some sense of that, right? There's linear data, there's non-linear data, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that we can look at in real time. And with our phones you know, and our devices and the things that capture things in real time, we're coming into a completely new space with Web3. And that's where I, I hope that you know, philanthropists will also come behind scientists and, and, and kind of uh, disruptive thinkers to really um, uh, confront the space together and put some shape into, into the progress that we need to see. Thanks very much. Uh, Ming Chong, you're a man of the world. Uh, I've known you a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts regarding uh, where you see the opportunities for publicly and privately funded initiatives, or novel business models, um, um, and, and how longevity medicine might appear in a global stage, uh, longevity medicine in Singapore. Okay, uh, um, unlike this distinguished panel, my background is um, as a family office. We run operational businesses and f financial investments. Uh, so we, we take uh, very precious hard-earned capital and uh, lose our pants and just try not to do that too often. <laughs> so uh, in the business world, we are used to failure. Uh, and uh, we realize that getting it wrong is part of getting it right. We also recognize uh, disruption. Disruption is an extremely powerful force. And uh, we also know that if we keep doing the same old things the same old way, uh, it, 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 it's not going to work. So we try to seek opportunities before they become obvious. So I, first, I, I'd like to say, um, Professor Allen, uh, it, it's such a pleasure to see today uh, much of the leadership of NUS Professor Benjamin Ong, Professor John Wong, Professor Yo Ke Guan, and the illustrious dean on my left, Professor Chong Yap Singh. And it's wonderful to see them standing behind the Center for Healthy Longevity and to see you know, two people whose work I've admired in the literature for a long time, Professor Kennedy and Professor Meyer. And not only to see them in the literature, but to see them you know, inspiring us by what they're trying to do wrestling with the practical problems on the ground. In business, we know that um, we seek to do ordinary things extraordinarily well. And that's part of what needs to be executed. So there's so much to be done. There's so much opportunity. Uh, there is clear disruption and uh, changing mindsets are needed. Businessmen look, look at the biomedical space and recognize that there's probably more knowledge accumulation in the last you know, few months than in the last many years beforehand. And so as we have seen so many other industries disrupted, uh, we are certain that this biomedical space uh, is going to be greatly disrupted. So I'm really grateful to, to NUS uh, and the leadership, you know, for standing behind what is going to be a, a really exciting endeavor. And I think uh, I'll remember this day that the Centri Center for Health Healthy Longevity opened and uh, you know, Professor Kennedy and Professor Meyer really did their best to uh, 
uh, beat the drum and bring the flag forward. And that would be to Singapore and, and the greater world's benefit. So from a business perspective, we see this as marvelous opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. From, let me just have a follow-on real quick, and not to be too mercenary, but from disruption and chaos comes opportunity. From a business perspective, if, if, we, have, uh, if we have longevity medicine that suddenly uh, 100 years old is the expected, does that not create business opportunity in real estate and, and, um, and other entities that, that the business community stands up and listens and says this is a good thing, so it begets success. Uh, longevity begets a better business, which uh, contributes to uh, uh, longevity science. Maybe so I'm being... You're talking industries close to my heart, <laughs> David, but um, I, I just want to say that uh, you know, the, the opportunities are there and, and they need to be seized. And it's not an easy thing because um, you know, medicine particularly and business and government in Singapore uh, have been very well organized and after a while the vertical silos get ossified and uh, in a fast-changing world where science is uh, re being rewritten every few months uh, we need to break more of these vertical silos let them be more porous and uh, so that we can have particularly the creativity that comes from people in overlapping fields you know, we, we are so excited about uh, Prof. Ko Win Pui's uh, comments on clinician scientists. We're, you know, we're so, um, uh, you know, interesting to see uh, clinicians try to understand the basic science better and the basic science people to try and understand how the clinicians are struggling with clinical problems in the clinic. So these are examples of where greater porosity is needed, certainly public-private. Incidentally, the, the first public-private partnership in Singapore was a biomedical one in 2002. It's not an easy thing to do, but we need more public-private partnerships and we need the, both the sectors to interact. The university is a wonderful place, but it cannot be an ivory tower all on its own. And it's wonderful to see NUS engage with the community and the different stakeholders in Singapore. And certainly, I think the private sector uh, you know, can play a role to complement these important, uh, these important goals. Thanks very much for your thoughtful response. Professor May, you're a medical anthropologist, a internal medicine physician, a medical executive, and a medical educator. How can we communicate the benefit? This has been a great uh, inaugural event. How can we communicate the importance uh, to various cultural uh, communities in Singapore and across Singapore and the region? Um, let me start with a declosure, um, disclosure. I am married to one of the two directors of the Center of Healthy Law. Turn his mic off, turn his mic um, off. And it's, it's not Brian, it's Brian. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, you can laugh about it. I'm the last one to laugh. Um, well, you can ask why is it possible that uh, such a beautiful woman is interested in such an old man? Well, her aging interest is even expended in her private life. Um, Back to your question. Thank you. Um, how can we, how can we, we make this uh, paradigm shift broader than only the group that we bring together here? Remain. I think that's the, the way you're asking. Um, in my opinion, over the last 15 years, I've been working on um, on uh, aging and longevity for the last 25 years. But in, in the last 15 years, I became to I came to the impression and to the conclusion that the only way to get this paradigm shift into healthcare is by educating the youngest and the youngest. That is our bachelor students, that is our master students, that is our young doctors, and not only them, we have to educate our executives as well. The executives uh, have to understand what the paradigm shift is. We are going from repair care to prevention and to longevity. We're going from aging, repair care to longevity. That's a journey that we all um, uh, we all made in our minds and through our research, but that is a difficult one to explain and it needs a complete reorganization of the healthcare system. If you really um, uh, uh, ponder about what is happening now and for the coming 25 years, then the paradigm shift is so huge that we should rethink the way we educate and we teach our medical students, we teach our 
um, uh, medical staff, in, in not only doctors, but nurses, physiotherapists, whatever. And we have to have executives who have in-depth knowledge of what is needed in the future. That is starting point number one. We, uh, we already set up some studies in, in Holland, and that's why um, um, the director asked me to come over and, and, and think with them to, uh, towards a program for further education in longevity. And I think that is one of the things that is missing yet. If we don't do it, we will never succeed in the paradigm shift. Both in the medical executive realm and in the undergraduate realm? Yep. 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 Uh, those well, programs are in place in Amsterdam? There are three programs. Uh, and that's the same as we propose here. We want um, uh, boot camp training for bachelor's and, and master's students. We want a uh, master um, uh, study for young doctors and those who are interested in longevity. That can be researchers, can be doctors. And we want an executive program for those who are in uh, executive positions or are building up their career in that direction. Um, that is That are three um, uh, lacks of a necessary change. Excellent, thanks. Wu um, Pui, what infrastructure that we don't have now do we need to be successful going forward? Um, well, one, um, one element that I hope will grow um, is that we will see an auditorium filled not just with clinicians, and scientists, but there was, the next symposium or conference will bring people from sociology, the sociologists, the engineers, the architects, the economists. Because I found when I was studying diseases, and that I never need, needed to worry a lot uh, about what the subjects did on their free time. I mean, I just want to know if they smoked, if they drank alcohol, if they exercised. But now that I'm doing aging, it is so multidimensional. And I'm just, one of my papers that I recently published in Aging that I'm proudest of is actually a paper on social isolation that I did with a good friend from the department of, uh, from, the school, from the faculty of arts and social sciences. And she, he helped me realize that there is a dimension called social frailty, which interacts with physical frailty and cognitive frailty. And I would never be able to understand or solve physical frailty without knowing how social frailty interacts with these other elements. So I think one of the infrastructure, if I may call it, is to have a way of bringing people across disciplines. I mean, the whole university should be involved in aging. I mean, today we have it in School of Medicine. The next time we should have it in a neutral place, maybe the university hall, and make sure that it is open to everyone, making, sure, make, making them realize that they have a role to play because the engineers, the architects are looking at how to change the environment. And when we study subjects and say, well, you need a physical environment to promote physical activity, how does that work? So I know Professor John Wong, he's going to talk about it later, I won't steal his thunder, but I think that's what he's trying to do, building, uh, having a health district that really bring people of all sorts of expertise and spe specialty together. And aging just does it more than any other diseases or outcomes that, that we have to study. So I think we have to do a lot more. I mean, even in... Uh, the School of Music, they wanted to come in and see how music therapy you know, makes a change. I know Dr. Feng Lei has done an intervention looking at how choir delays cognitive, uh, impair, uh, uh, cognitive decline. So I think, you know, and Singapore being so small, we are so easily connected, we are quick to communicate. The only thing that is going to stop will be our inherent fear, prejudice, bias, because we don't know what the other people do. Mm. Um, yep, Singh, what does success look like? In, in, in longevity medicine, or the program, the, the future? Yeah, well, I think success would, uh, would look uh, like a, a room, not an auditorium, not only with uh, doctors, scientists, uh, sociologists, and other people, but also policy makers uh, in a room paying attention. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's tough sort of complaining about the lack of infrastructure in Singapore because it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful country with fantastic opportunities, right? So this morning, we have evidence of that. We have uh, had our deputy prime minister here in the audience, and he was just here two weeks ago or three weeks ago um, making a long speech about uh, healthy longevity. So he gets it. Um, and in Singapore, that opportunity to engage with policymakers um, regularly and deeply 
uh, is unprecedented, I think, around the world. Because I, and one of the main things is just that the stability and far-sightedness of our government. So, um, the, the, so uh, our DPGAN uh, has gotten it. Uh, so now the question, the thing is to make sure the rest of the cabinet and all the relevant policy makers also get it. So, and then to start to to see them uh, soaring above reality and and uh, doing things that are possible only in Singapore to begin with. And because Singapore is such a beacon uh, to the region and maybe the world, uh, it will be a good way to then spread that thinking uh, beyond our shores. So that, that I think would be a, a real um, success for us where policy uh, transcends uh, just simple reality and what is uh, practical. And I, I think um, what I would really like to see then is for people to start changing uh, think concepts like retirement age um, and, and looking at old, older people not as a burden but as a, you know, as, as a undiscovered gem that uh, we should actually mine uh, and, and for them to really continue to function well and uh, happily in society. And I think that will make all the change in terms of economics, uh, health, and happiness. Hmm. I'll open the floor to questions. I'm sure we'll have a few. This is a very auspicious. Uh, in, in, uh, brain trust here. There's, a, I believe, Dr. Soin has a question. Then I can ask Andrea and Brian later what they think is success. They define success. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been a marvelous discussion. But I think that one, what we need to build uh, longevity, longevity medicine infrastructure in Singapore in general, not the policymakers and the professionals, is that we have to look at ageism. Now, ageism, like in many other countries, is very much alive in Singapore. It's alive in the workplace. It's alive even in research. It's alive in policies that, you know. So unless we do away with ageism, the acceptance for longevity medicine is going to be difficult. Any other questions? Yes, there's a gentleman in the back. Thank you. Um, it, it's great, uh, the work that's going on at um, uh, NUS, and clearly academia here in Singapore gets it, and indeed is working on it, and taking the Dean's comments, it sounds like the policymakers and government increasingly are getting it, there may be more to go there. Um, are there other groups that need to get it, uh, in the sense of, we've heard so much today about lifestyle medicine, preventative health, we have these, the core components uh, of longevity. Um, what other groups need to get it? Is it the insurance industry has to get involved? Is it corporate benefit schemes? Who else um, do the policy makers need to turn to and say, okay, we're doing our bit and you've got philanthropists and they're all contributing massively, but who else needs to start getting the plot, if, if I can put it that way. Professor Chong? Um, so all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, let me just say uh, that I, I knew uh, Dr. Soyan was going to mention ageism. That's why I mentioned retirement age and, <laughs> and things like that. No, absolutely true. So um, uh, we, you know, uh, the, the current sort of uh, look at how life should be lived in, in, in the 21st century is actually a, a fairly new concept. The idea that when you're young, you study, and then when you uh, reach adulthood, that you start to work, and after you finish working, you, you retire, right? So in old days, before, before the 20th century, it would be you, you are young as a child, and then you work, and then you die. You know, that's, um, and, and that happens very fast. Um, so, being a teenager and being having education is uh, something that's a luxury that's come in only in, a, in a, probably the 20th century. And then retirement is even a, a greater if, luxury, if you want to call it that way, uh, that only people in the, the 20th 
21st century are experiencing in the past. Retirement was very short, right? When Singapore was, became independent, uh, retirement age was 62 and life expectancy was 65. So retirement is three years. Now you still retire at um, 63, maybe, I think the current official age, uh, but we are living to 85 uh, in, in, on average. So ageism is based on um, a concept that is not fundamental uh, reality. It needs to be re rethought completely. So completely agree, ageism is something we have to uh, get rid of. And as Dr. Soin herself will often say, ageism is a uh, bias against ourselves, our future selves, right? So all of us here are either in the midlife chasm, <laughs> current old, or the future old. So, um, so completely agree. Now, in regard regarding the other people who should get it, uh, really everybody needs to get it. The, the whole change of paradigm that, um, if you look at a chronological age, yes, of course that doesn't change. But, you know, we all know, have examples of real biological variation in age, right? You have 50, 70 year old people who are wheelchair bound in an institution. And then you have uh, the same age, people at the same age doing marathons and, and, and other amazing things. So we, we see for ourselves that chronological age doesn't reflect biological age or health. So we, we need to all get that and realize that um, it's within our power to some extent to actually determine uh, how healthy we remain uh, as we age chronologically. And you know, one, one interesting thing was that I think uh, several, of us, several of us were at a longevity forum in London in 2017. And it was a really terrible meeting, right? Half the people there were scientists, half were I don't, you know, other people. And the topics were this uh, incoherent and it wasn't a great meeting. So um, I wasn't particularly impressed. But two years later in 2019, again in London, I attended the same longevity forum. This time around, two thirds of the audience were venture capitalists. Um, and, and, and basically the business community has gotten it, right? That there is a lot of potential uh, in the idea of um, a longer life and its potential uh, long uh, dividend, uh, as well as the potential to move the needle uh, where health span is concerned. So I, I think, uh, and you know, business is a powerful force. If the business people get it, all of us will be paying for it at some point in time. So. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I, I fully agree with you, uh, but there's one group that is overlooked um, and a, a group that I still cannot um, approach and don't know how to, to, to get them into the field of longevity. And that is the medical professional who is doing the things that he already does for the last 30 years. Uh, there is ageism in it, and I was um, uh, impressed by the, uh, the, the, the slide that Nir Basilai showed, where you can see that uh, uh, healthcare expenditure for someone who's, uh, in the last two years, for someone who's a centenarian, is so low compared to the 60, 70 years. That might be an ageism um, bias in uh, the decisions doctors make. If you come to um, a hospital and you're 90 years old and you have a hemorrhage, there is hardly anything that they will do at the moment. If you're 60, they do everything they can to save your life. And that's true. I can give you examples. Um, and so ageism is within the system. Um, the, 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 most of the specialized doctors think that um, aging and longevity has something to do with wheelchairs and diapers. That's not completely correct. Um, and so we have to see, uh, we have to look for approaches where we can uh, we can uh, in, in introduce the whole concept of longevity and the paradigm shifts in the present practitioners in hospitals uh, or wherever they practice. Chris, did you want to? I, I was just wanted to jump in there. You know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And if we do the same old thing all the time for the rest of our lives, and nothing's going to change. And, and I mean, aging is meant to be the golden years, right? And what's so golden about it if you just not notice the gold? And, and like what Yap Singh says, you know, that there is a huge amount of missed opportunity where we are. And, and if we can just turn those opportunities, not just throw money at it, just harness what we have and then just turn it into gold and venture capitalists will come into the space because there is a lot of opportunity to harness. And, uh, but we have to do things differently. And I think that's the, that's the, the war cry from today, isn't it? Yeah. John? Sorry, whoops. Uh, uh, John Wong from Singapore. I just want to make one defense of the medical uh, system. Uh, because I think that 
I do think that actually doctors do, you know, I think all doctors do believe that prevention is key. Um, but we need to change incentives uh, and we need to change the way we fund things. Now, um, people may not be aware, but in terms of That's how much the next countries. Panel, John. That's the next, yeah, I just yeah. want to finish by saying about how much countries spend on preventive health. The OECD average is under 3% of the national health care expenditure. It's about 2.4%. The, the only country that spends 5.9% is Canada. Okay, and so if you think of national health care expenditures and if, if the whole country is only spending 2.4% on prevention, I think it's a, it really requires us as a society to say, are we really going to invest in prevention because of all the information that we heard today? Uh, because otherwise, if we just want to pay for treatment and we're only going to seek treatment when we've got an ailment, well, the medical system has to cater to the treatment aspect of it. Thank you. Last thoughts? Excellent. I want to thank the panel for their time and, and uh, sharing their knowledge with us. And thank you very much. We have gifts for them. All right, thanks again. Uh, our second panel, uh, again, um, we're, we're looking to how to actually implement uh, and, and succeed in, in longevity medicine, uh, and we're looking for practical, pragmatic issues. So our second segment is on concrete initiatives with uh, influence on longevity medicine, and uh, I'd like to invite to the, uh, uh, to the uh, stage Mr. Henry Queck, who is Member of Parliament, uh, Parliament from uh, Kevin Baru. Uh, single member constituency, uh, Professor Benjamin Ong, who's Senior Vice President, Health Education and Resources at National University Hospital and Chairman of Health Sciences Authority. Um, Associate Professor uh, Jason Pua, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Alexandra Hospital and a, a critical care physician. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor John Wong, uh, who's the Isabel Chan Professor in Medical Sciences, uh, Senior Vice President, Health Innovation and Translation at National University of Singapore and a senior advisor to National University Health Systems. And uh, Professor Roger Fu, who is the director of Cardiovascular Disease Translational Research Program and assistant dean for research at uh, NUS uh, Young Lulin School of Medicine. They're all, they're all safe. Okay. Oh, no, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's obligatory. You can sit wherever you like. All right. You can sit wherever you like, yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, whoops, excuse me, let me just catch up with where I meant to be. Um, Professor Ong, uh, first question for you. Uh, how does your work contribute to longevity medicine infrastructure in Singapore? Where's the interface? Yeah, the interface hopefully works. I would say that you're really talking about what I used to do. Um, what I used to do essentially was uh, health policy. And uh, while I didn't think of my job primarily as just looking at longevity, it really was to improve the health of every Singaporean. Um, policies that then go into play in that particular area have to start from when individuals are well until end of life. And um, I had the privilege to actually get involved in actually building out that ecosystem 
to some extent when uh, I was directly involved in uh, that space. Um, in particular, I think if you look at um, the build-up of community care and primary care, there was one area that we spent a fair bit of energy and time on. Um, and because as a physician myself and a neurologist, um, like John and many of my colleagues, we are always dealing with the end result of many years of maybe neglect. Uh, it's a little bit like Sisyphus trying to push that boulder up, you know, a mountain and have it just keep falling down on you. I felt that if we could try to reduce the number of people who had significant disabilities or mobilities, you know, as, as they got older, we could try to lengthen a healthy lifespan as a whole. So part of that was um, expressed in maybe what most Singaporeans refer to as the war on diabetes which was part of that whole exercise that uh, went into play before we, uh, we were dealing with COVID and before that moved to, to a broader healthy SG that the current uh, sort of leadership is moving on. So that was my involvement in the past. Thanks. As chairman of uh, Health Services Authority, um, is, there, is there any change in mindset uh, as far as how new drugs are evaluated or or uh, authorized uh, in light of uh, maybe preventative medicine as opposed to uh, therapeutics? Or, you know. I don't think at present that there is a significant paradigm shift overall. Um, maybe not yet. I, I would say that maybe the opportunities that were brought about over the past three years and even prior to that because of the, the very rapid changes in the type of interventions that we had have catalyzed changes in the way in which the health sciences authorities, regulatory branches, do their work. Um, by and large, um, a lot of this is based on need um, and bringing those to the fore so that we can apply them in the population um, you know, at scale, I think, are, are the, main, the, main, uh, the main role of the regulators in that particular setting. So if you're asking me whether or not there will be more available sort of modalities for management, I suspect there will be going forward as science advances and as we find more potential uh, sort of uh, solutions, um, they will have to get more directly involved. And there are ways in which they're doing that now that are different from the past. Great, thanks. Jason, um, how, how does your work at Alexandra Hospital uh, uh, impact uh, or interface with longevity medicine? Th thanks, David. Um, I, I heard you introduce uh, me as a critical care physician, and, and I must say that uh, I, I just cannot get away with the, you know, the irony of it all, right? Um, on the one hand, through the course of the day, we've heard about uh, health span rather than lifespan and uh, sick care uh, versus health care. And, and on the other hand, as a physician, I am always practicing sick care, uh, lifespan at most. Healthcare, what? <laughs> and it is ironic. And the other thing about the, this ironic thing is that uh, we, we are part of a management team of a hospital. And traditionally, hospitals are about care. I'm not even sure it's about healthcare. It's about care, sick care. And so I, I think um, what uh, Professor John said in defense of the medical profession, uh, it is really real. Uh, this, this whole irony, we as clinicians are trained to treat the sick. We as hospitals are funded to treat the sick. And so when you ask me what does Alexandra Hospital do for healthy longevity, um, I, I really struggle to answer that um, because we are not much different from any other hospital in Singapore. And so I would just say that at the end of the day, I think healthy longevity is a spectrum. I think that number one, we will inevitably still see elderly people with lots of comorbidities, frailty, etc. And it's our job, even though they are sick, to make it as unsick as possible for them. Number two, we will see middle-aged people with comorbidities, even though we have been taught this morning to forget about diseases. And it, I think it's our job to look at how um, we can make sure that they do not become the first category of elderly with all kinds of frailty. And number three, and this is the exciting thing, what is the role of a hospital in longevity medicine uh, when people are young and to prevent all the consequences of uh, aging? And to that end, I think at Alexandra, 
Uh, I will just say three things. One, we are building a new campus, a uh, campus looking at uh, three, what we call game changers, the way we provide care, the way we use technology, the way we deploy our infrastructure. Uh, two, and I'm sure Professor Wong will talk a lot about this, uh, we are cited in the Queenstown Health District and, and there's huge uh, opportunities for hospital and community to collaborate, uh, not just for care, but for health, uh, not just for hospital, but for infrastructure in the community. And three, uh, the Centre for Healthy Longevity is literally cited in Alexandra and uh, thanks to Dr. Andrea Maria, uh, uh, her team is going to start the first longevity medicine clinic uh, in 2023. So that's my long answer. Thanks. Short no, no, I appreciate that. John, how about your work? How does it contribute to longevity medicine? Um, well, I, I'll start off with my immediate past role. Uh, um, uh, I was the chief executive of the National University Health System, and what we did five years ago was be very involved in the discussion that if we really wanted to keep a population healthy, we really needed to integrate the whole health delivery system from prevention to early diagnosis to management to rehabilitation to end of life. So Singapore now has got three integrated health systems ranging from primary care, uh, hospital care, uh, hospital, essentially home care, and really trying to look at this whole concept of how do, you, uh, you know, how do you integrate all your services to ensure that you follow the patient from being well all the way to end of life. So that's a, that, that's a key component. Um, I was told no slides, but unfortunately I do, I want, uh, if I can just show one slide, to just to, to grasp the concept in two minutes, what we are doing now, because population health is actually the fourth arm of an academic health system. We all talk about education, research, clinical care, but ultimately it must impact population health. So we've actually adopted a, a township uh, of 100,000 people, reflective of Singapore in 2030. So these 100,000 people, 80% stay in public housing, 23% uh, are already over the age of 60. And what we want is a whole of society, whole of government, real world location-based uh, platform where we can test everything that you heard today. Um, but more than that, because I think we heard a lot about preventive health in the one column, but we think it's equally important to look at giving everyone a sense of purpose. Uh, because if one of the biggest detractors to health is actually financial insecurity and a loss of value and a loss of a sense of purpose. So those are the two pillars. And the platform we have is planning and design is essentially the built environment. Singapore is a very urbanized society. How do you shape the, the, the built environment to enable those two pillars? How do you use technology? How do you communicate the value of what we're doing to everyone, especially the residents, and critically, how do we evaluate to make sure we're on the right path? Um, so there are four goals. We want to not only increase healthy longevity, but we want to enable purposeful longevity. Uh, we want to strengthen intergenerational cohesion because ageism is a key issue that we have to address. And we want to support a community for all ages so you can age in place that people should not have to go to a nursing home at the end of their life. So this is what we're doing, and I'm glad to say that we've involved every discipline in the university. Uh, so not only the, the physical sciences and the health sciences, but the social sciences. We've managed, uh, so this is a university health system working with the Housing and Development Board and all the other government agencies, social sector and the private sector are all involved in this effort. Thanks, John. Henry, how, how is your work in, uh, impacted by what John's talking about and by uh, the, the impact it's going to have on uh, uh, longevity medicine. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, John is looking at Queenstown. Uh, that's 100,000. I'm a um, member of parliament for Kerman Borough constituency that's around 30,000 people. Now, uh, I'd like to share that a lot of what we can do and we must do is to build social capital to provide social prescription. Okay, think about it. We know how to take care of sick care, but how do you do health care? You have to persuade people who are not necessarily sick yet 
to do that. You're talking about lifestyle intervention. And if they want to do lifestyle intervention, they must, the why is very, very important. And so that's where the social capital, social prescription is necessary. Um, let me backtrack a little bit to say why I came to that conclusion. Um, we have a particularly established program in my constituency, which we started off. We provided an assisted living program to some of our most vulnerable seniors. The most vulnerable seniors in Singapore live in rental flats without money, without in poor health, in dire health states. So what we have done is we have took care of some of them, we have linked them out of the healthcare system so that the doctors prescribe not just medicine, how to take care of them, but also what do they need socially. And what is amazing witnessing this firsthand is to see how their healthcare status improve. We didn't need any clinical trial. It was happening be before my eyes. It was very clear within months they were in much better shape. So that is clearly important. Now, a lot of the things that we can do a lot will depend on the science that's done by this team in this room. So you guys are the Calvary. You guys are going to help us figure out how to smoke, drink, and still live to 100 years old, right? <laughs> but until then, uh, my job as a community organizer, we're putting on the road, is to allow as many Singaporeans to live that, make sure that they're okay using the best available science and care there is. And that's where the social capital needs to come in. So what I'm doing in my constituency is that seeing the first-hand experience of how we take care of these vulnerable people through social prescription, now the thing is how do we come up with an operating system to connect everybody up to all the seniors up so that they can have access to the best health care, let's say the best sports facilities, the best social activities, the best uh, financial assistance, the best digital assistance, they're already there in our community, but how do we connect them all together and how do we get every nodal point in the community to spread the message? Let me be very specific. It means that we have people who go outreach to every senior in the community, telling them all the available resources. It means that we must have um, an incoming helpline which I'm organizing to help seniors navigate the system and help them point them to the right resources. It means we need to make sure that we have certain walk-in places, senior activity centers, the grassroots clubs, the various uh, places, GPs, uh, polyclinics. They need to all have that service directory so that we can refer people to the right place. And if we have that in place, I think that social, that, and, and that, all that is social capital then we can make sure that the people have the access and more importantly, the motivation to go seek that out. Because let me give you a, breath, a good example. You can have two healthy people being healthy and happy. One passes on, the other is miserable. How, unless you can provide that social subscription, that fellowship, that friendship, you're not going to get the other party to be motivated to seek the best treatment. So that social capital to provide that social prescription is not just important for today, but when you all have the right medical intervention, it is necessary to allow us to achieve health care. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you're describing the social capital and social prescription to what you obviously see people living better and longer lives. And we expect our Geron, uh, Geron, uh, Gero Science brothers and sisters to be able to tell us why that's happening. So, Roger, that's a good segue to you. <laughs> Tell us what you're doing uh, involved in uh, longevity medicine. Yeah, thank, thank Make you. it a success, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, David. So, um, so the way I see it is we are set here like chess pieces in a way. So great kudos to uh, Andrea because she's clearly put focus on clinician scientists. Uh, and it's not clear on the uh, labels above, but uh, I head up the Clinician Scientists Academy, which uh, the leadership on this campus uh, very uh, uh, fortuitously put together um, in the early uh, times before COVID, uh, just a couple of years ago. So I'm the counterfoil to Wun Pui, who is sat in this very chair. Uh, and our work together has really kind of going upstream, 
uh, to almost like hopefully not in the ivory tower, but really building up a research uh, environment for clinicians uh, who want to get into research deeply uh, as part of their career. So going beyond seeing patients, uh, which is what you hear Jason describe, and really getting quite far out into uncomfortable uh, frontier zones. Uh, maybe like what uh, Dean described, um, flying beyond realist realistic uh, uh, ground level um, areas. But, uh, and almost even now going into the medical school where our medical students are already so primed by their uh, high school education, which is as increasingly we see a lot of science at very high level uh, being taught at their schools and coming into a medical school so primed into thinking research. So I would say even 10 years ago, looking back, um, the typical medical student would not be so familiar with doing research uh, at the level that they are today and definitely not at the level as the whole nation is today. So what are we doing uh, in the Clinician Scientist Academy, Clinician Scientist Development Unit? Uh, in building longevity medicine specifically. So the term longevity medicine, as I was listening to the speakers across the day, I'm not sure I missed a few talks. I'm not sure if it was brought up. I noticed that uh, in my lifetime as clinicians, we heard about evidence-based medicine. It then segued way to precision medicine. And today we are talking here about longevity medicine. It hasn't struck me so much, but I wonder whether we are now witnessing the third wave of a really good, strong cry towards a different form of thinking about medicine uh, worldwide. So we'll see if the presidential office from the large country, United States, calls that out, then it really will be uh, the third way of thinking about medical care, uh, longevity medicine. So yeah, let's open the doors, bring it up to the medical students, bring it through residency uh, programs, uh, offer this up as research. We work very hard together across the campus here uh, to synchronize as much research uh, resources as much possible together. We know the um, centers exist between Brian and, and um, Andrea, and actually in the larger uh, um, space of that translational research program of which Wun Pui is one, and then there are other um, professors and principal investigators in uh, healthy longevity program too. So the juniors, the residents, the uh, medical students have not have it any better than today if they want to get into research for longevity medicine. So you're hopeful. Very hopeful. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so do you feel like we have a critical mass of geroscientists or the opportunity for geroscientists to collaborate? I know that's not necessarily your area, but... It, it's it, not a question for me, David, a question yeah, for Andrea, yeah, but yeah. The, prob the answer probably is never enough. Yeah. So... Uh, but you see, you see the pipeline of, of potential some, yeah. Yeah, young clinician scientists. Definitely. Yeah. I think we are still digesting upon the term precision medicine, to be honest. Uh, and then for clinicians to think about how they are practicing uh, precision medicine, uh, bring in and layer on uh, longevity medicine. I mean, we are clever students. We are, you know, among the best medical schools in the world, and then you know, definitely very high up in uh, in terms of uh, um, highly clever thinking medical students. So it's not going to be far away before they uh, can consider how they can bring this into their medical practice. Uh, accompanying their research, whether it's research for uh, in the center of their career or whether bolted on together with their clinical practice. Yeah, definitely uh, great potential. Mm. Good to hear. Professor Ong, um, we're changing the focus of healthcare. I'm going to ask you to put your, your former policy hat on and view into the future. We're going from curation to prevention. How do we sustainably fund it for, for all Singaporeans? We, we talked about uh, access. There was a lot of uh, discussion about access to care for whole of society. Yeah, I, I think that's the big question, essentially, about how you're actually going to try and do this. The first salvo that has been fired has been talk about capitation, where one of the three sort of health clusters that John was speaking about now would be given funding for each individual in the ecosystem that's being cared for. And the understanding here is that you do it from cradle to end of life. That's one way in which you can look at it. Um, I think that 
sometime in the not too distant future, we'll have to try and figure out something similar to how we fund episodic care in Singapore. Um, for those of, of you that know how we fund healthcare in Singapore, we call it the three M's plus S. MediSafe, you know, MediShield, MediFund and subsidies. But this is designed for consumption of care. And when we're talking essentially about chronic disease, uh, the way in which you fund it has to morph to something different. We refer to that, and Hisham is in, in the audience here and he's worked with me before. We call it CHAS you know, as well to try and do that. And we do have a polyclinic system. But this is just a health care site. And we're still talking about health care. We really want to start to think essentially about health and longevity as a whole. This has to extend beyond healthcare to all the other elements that keep a person healthy and well. Right now, I think most of the organization of the way in which we do things, uh, in my view, are still domin dominated by healthcare settings and healthcare experts. When we were trying to work on the war on diabetes, we realized that you need the other organizations on board. Um, we talked essentially about people enjoying guitar playing. I think it's, it's um, you know, Philip Sierra earlier on about what he enjoys, you know. Um, and for some, it might be sports and staying active. Now, is longevity and keeping people active um, in the radar of Sports SG? Or is it just building elite athletes? I think from what John has been trying to push in terms of the health district, it's the right idea. Because every single uh, stat body or ministry in Singapore, if they start to think that this is important enough to unlock Singapore's future, then we have to figure out how we move from providing for healthcare and funding for healthcare to a new system. Where social prescribing is a, is a term where you are, are able to you know, get an individual to access different types of resources in society becomes something that's commonplace. And it's not, it shouldn't be the purview of a healthcare professional to do that, right? Because if you leave it to the situation where you must always go to a doctor or a healthcare setting to be able to gain access, I think that would miss the point. So we need to rethink that. And if I were to think about Singapore's existential challenges going forward, there are many of them, right? There's energy, there's sea levels, but one of the existential crises we have will be manpower. And I think this is why it's so very important that we think long and hard about this and why a conference like today is, is so important to catalyze thinking along those lines. Mr. Kwek, thank um, you. I'd like to add on a little bit about that. Another way we can try to bend the cost curve is to really get younger Singaporeans involved in health. And I'm personally very optimistic about that. Um, over lunch, uh, Professor Wong and I were talking, he was asking me what age do you think we should get Singaporeans involved in all this? I suggested 40. Because according to An Professor Andrew Meyer's chart, right, where the arc curve of our health uh, peaks at 21 and it's all downhill after that. Right? So the earlier we can get Singaporeans uh, involved in, the quicker and better it is. And the best way to do so is to do so through personal motivation. And the way to do personal motivation is that COVID, at least in Singapore, I've witnessed how COVID shifted the mindset of many young people. I think our society is ready for it. What we are lacking, which is what the room here is able to provide, is that dashboard, that biological clock, that biomarker, so for us to self-manage our lives. I'm wearing an over ring, right? I obsess over like, yeah, thank you, yes, many of us do. But we, we are trying to manage and optimize our lives. And so we, as long as we can get those tools that you're working on out there as quickly as possible, we can connect that to many, many uh, intermediaries in Singapore that is willing to push for that. And I can assure you that there's the parts of government that I work with, they are very keen to do that. Let me give you one example. In Singapore, we started off trying to encourage people to do sports, so we put stadiums everywhere. The last time I visited a stadium, they're growing vegetables there. <laughs> they are having uh, very random activities there. Of course, the first thing that goes to my mind is, why are you doing so many things? They're like, actually, we are doing this because we are trying to get people to exercise. They realize that middle-aged people do not exercise after a while because the father goes over to the, 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 to the stadium and then leaves the family behind, the family gets upset. 
right? So what they're doing is they're trying to make sure that the whole family can go to the stadium on the Friday night and there's something for everybody to do so that they all go to the stadium. And if you can't get anyone to exercise, everyone to exercise, you at least get some of them versus none of them exercising. So these are some of the, uh, the, the holistic uh, approaches that the, the various government agencies are doing. And so we now need the toolkit from you guys to equip us to get the younger Singaporeans involved and that will help us bend the cost curve. John? Well, I think that you know, if we can create the virtuous cycle um, to unlock the human, social, and economic capital of an, a hundred year lifespan, that will create the resources to be able to enable this whole cycle to turn. So, you know, I, there are probably three papers which uh, stick in my mind. One is by Barrel et al. It, who showed that if you increase the working life of, and this, this was in the UK, so if you increase the working life of the UK population by one year, you increase GDP by 1.5% over four years. And then there was another paper by Bloom et al., which showed that the GDP output of people over the age of 60 in North America and Europe was 7.3% in terms of monetary and defined non-monetary activity. And a defined non-monetary activity is if the grandchildren are looked after by the grandparents, freeing the parents to go to work. And then the third data point was by Scott et al., which showed that in the United States alone, one more year of productive life will give the US $37 trillion. Trillion. So what we need to do is take all the incredible work coming out of you know, people in the audience and the Center for Healthy Longevity, which by the way is one of those pillars uh, in Queenstown. So all the clinical trials, we're hoping that the clinical trials, a lot of them will be done in the Queenstown area. Because if we can, if we can unlock the 100 year lifespan instead of just a 50 or 60 year lifespan, we will create enormous capital. It's just like when women entered the workforce. You look at how the whole economy's changed after the 1950s. Just imagine if we had people in their 70s and even in their 80s still meaningfully engaged in the workforce, uh, what it could do. Jason, you're, you're at the, the pointy end of, of changing how healthcare is paid for as a medical executive. Uh, what do you see are the potential things that make you sweaty at night leading the hospital that you do? A lot. Um, <laughs> but if you're talking about how healthcare is paid for, um, I think Professor Ong has already uh, summarized a little bit of it. And I, I think our current sense, and when I say our, I, I, I think I represent a lot of the chief, chief executives in hospitals today. Uh, our current sense is that uh, even with capitation, that's one. Uh, and number two, even with uh, what's currently called population health funding, i.e. The, the, the government is uh, paying the casters to provide funding to enable the GPs to provide uh, better care and better health. Um, our current sense is that it is insufficient. Um, and with the current amount of money, uh, at most what we can do is shift a little bit of care from the hospital to the community. Not a lot. Uh, which means that uh, I don't think that we're going to make a very, very big impact uh, in terms of preventive care. Uh, short of funding from uh, philanthropy, short of uh, grants, uh, short of some other uh, ammunition uh, in terms of uh, finance that the government is going to pump in. So uh, if you ask me what makes me struggle uh, with insomnia uh, with regards to funding, it's this thing about the belief that we should really move a lot more from sick care to health care to health, but the reality that the current amount of funding is still very much targeted towards sick care, a little bit of health care, not much to health. Yeah. That's the reality. Okay. On that rather somber note, we're at the end of our time, and I want to thank all the panelists and join me in a round of applause for them.
Okay, thank you very much. Andre, over to you. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> I'll join. Um, so I was uh, given the task of summarizing the preclinical research, and Andrea told me I have one minute. So um, I think that uh, <laughs> it's now 40 seconds. I think rather than do that, I think that uh, what I'd like to do is summarize the fact that we're trying to generate a pipeline here that runs all the way from basic research through to preclinical to clinical and the translation that's meaningful for the community. And I think the the cost effectiveness of approaches, the, that plays all the way back into the preclinical stuff we do. We're looking at interventions that can be scaled. And so I think there have been a lot of specific advances in science, but the thing I took away from this is that 10 years ago, I don't think any of us that were in the aging field could imagine a conference like this where we have public health officials, where we have clinicians, where we have government officials, or the dean of the medical school, uh, here all trying to figure out how to solve this problem. I mean, Matt and I started off on yeast. Uh, you were working on long-term centenarian studies, probably doing stuff before that too, I know, I know. Uh, Henry was working on flies, and all of us now are talking about human aging and working on human aging, because I think almost everyone in the field has come to the realization that what we've learned is applicable, that it's possible to extend human health span. And we may not know the right approach, but I think we're all confident that some of the approaches will work. So you heard some of that this morning in the preclinical science, but I think that I don't see us as preclinical and clinical. I see us together trying to achieve a common goal, which is human health span. And so over to you, Andrea. Thank you so much. So I think this is what we want to do. We want a pipeline, and you have heard the talk, so uh, hopefully we did not convince you because you were already convinced too that geroscience is really the way. I would like to express my real thanks to everybody who organized this first conference we ever did within the Center for Health and Longevity. And that is Yong San, and this is Wiley, and Clarinda, um, Aim, all the other staff sitting there on the side, and we were always WhatsApping. A big applause Maybe to Maybe the team. staff that helped out could stand up. Please. Yes, stand up. Everybody. Yeah, everybody. stand up. Everybody. Let's go, stand up. All of you, I see a bunch of you not standing up. Stand up. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Um, please reach out to us. There is a form to be filled out if you want to leave your feedback, comments, etc. Maybe also what we should address in the second uh, conference, which we said would be next year. Let's start organizing today. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised you would say that. Yes. <laughs> there is a QA code. If you have any specifics, please let us know, because we are learning, as in the geroscience field, as in the uh, health and longevity medicine field, we are learning. And uh, I would like to see you next year, and uh, in between, I would like to really stimulate you, reach out and be in contact, and to build the ecosystem. Thank you so much. <laughs>